In this message, and in the next session following it, I am going to share vitally important keys of revelation from Scripture that will help us understand the times and the season that we are currently in, and what will be unfolding on the world stage in this time. These two sessions are going to be very, very special. They are my personal favorite of all that I share in the conference. And there's going to be lots of very anointed ministry music from Lisa Vitt in between. And I encourage you to focus on the words of each song very carefully as they bring alive what I am sharing at that time. It's also going to be a very long teaching because there are many pieces of the puzzle that I will be weaving together to show you an amazing picture that Abba Father wants us to see that is very prophetically significant for us concerning the times we are now in. And there are many vitally important keys of revelation that I am going to unpack. 
The Bible prophesied about the world events that are currently unfolding before our very eyes. And it's crucially important that we understand what is happening. And most importantly, that we understand what Abba Father is wanting to do in us at this time. I would normally split such a long teaching into several videos, but I have to keep this one together because otherwise the different pieces of the puzzle would be separated and lost and you would not be able to see the complete picture of what Abba Father is revealing to his bride at this time. The beauty of it being online is that you can stop and carry on where you left off as you need to. But I have wept many tears during the production of this session because of how deeply I treasure, cherish and appreciate the priceless value of what Abba Father is sharing with us in this time by his undeserved mercy and grace. It is a priceless privilege to receive this knowledge, wisdom, understanding and revelation that Abba Father is giving to his people worldwide by his Holy Spirit, revealing the mysteries of the Bible to us so that we can understand what is happening in this time. Matthew 5 verse 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. And it is the prayer of my heart that you won't even notice the length of this session, because your spirit and soul is being so deeply nourished and fed with the rich spiritual truths shared here, and that time would fly by as you are captivated by the mind-blowing keys of revelation our Father is giving us here in this message, which is a priceless treasure that we are so privileged to hold in our hands that is more precious than gold or silver. No matter where you've been, I'll 
return to you. I just want to mention that in this session, at times, I'm going to refer to Jesus, the Son of God, who is our Messiah, Bridegroom, and King, as Yeshua, which is his original name in Hebrew. We must remember that when Jesus taught in the New Testament, he gave his teachings in a Hebrew context because he grew up as a Hebrew and he was teaching Hebrew people. So if we are going to read the Bible through the grid of our own cultures, such as from the perspective of the English language, for example, we are going to misunderstand a lot of what the Bible was saying, and we will not get the full revelation of what was shared. For example, on the night before he was crucified, Jesus said to Peter that before the cock crows three times, Peter would deny him. Who of you were like me and thought that that referred to a chicken that crows early in the morning? The cock was actually the man in the temple who would blow the shofar to wake the people up for the morning service. And details like that are significant, for example, in working out where the temple was in Jerusalem. But I just mention that here just as one example of a simple misunderstanding. But there's a lot more important revelation that we miss if we don't at least have a basic understanding of the Hebrew culture and language, which is the context in which the Bible was written. For example, it is very beautiful to study the Hebrew customs of marriage because Jesus fulfilled every single one of those customs in his relationship with us as one of many ways of showing us that he not only wants to be our savior, but also our bridegroom and that he has proposed to us so that we can be his bride. There's a song we have on our first record called Beloved, and a lot of people ask me where did I get the idea of that song, because uh, it's basically God calling us his bride. And I wish I could take credit for originality, but it, it just comes out of scripture, all sorts of places God calls us his bride. And one of the most unsuspecting places we find that is in the Last Supper. At that time, they were celebrating the Passover feast, and Jesus is going through the, the ritual as a rabbi, and he comes to this very strange place where he picks up what scholars believe the third cup, the cup of salvation, as it were. And, in, and traditionally, you're supposed to just set that aside. But Jesus takes this cup, and he offers it to them. He says, this is my covenant. Take and drink it, which was... Outrageous for several reasons. One, because Jesus is declaring, hey, the Messiah is here. And two, in that time, in that period, to a bunch of Jewish fishermen, when they hear him saying, this is my covenant, take and drink it with a cup full of wine, what they heard is, will you marry me? Let me break it down. At that time, when a guy was going to marry a girl, this is what would happen. He'd basically go find his dad and go, yo, dad, this girl, man. I want to make little rabbis with her, you know what I'm saying? And so he would go to her dad and he'd go, let me give you for the camels for a daughter. And some of you go, that is so barbaric and archaic. I can't believe that they sold off the, the wives. Um, it actually wasn't terribly unromantic because it actually was just the chance for the guy. He would buy the chance to ask her. She actually got a say in this, which is kind of cool. Because basically what would happen is they'd get the family in the room and all the relatives talk about pressure and he'd sit down at a table and the groom, he'd fill a glass with wine and he'd slide it across the table and he'd say, this is my covenant with you, take and drink it. At which point she had the right, she could go, now you stank, you stank, you're like honest, I don't want none of that. Or she could drink it and if she drank it, that was her way of saying, I do. At which point, she'd go home to her town, and they would no longer call her by her name. This was cool. She was referred to as 
one who is bought with a price. A guy would go home to his town, and they wouldn't talk the whole engagement period. It'd be six months up to a year. The only way they communicated was the best man would basically run back and forth like a text messenger, you know, like, check yes, no, or maybe. In the meantime, the groom is back at his dad's house, and he's building a mansion. Now, before you get excited, girls, mansion in Hebrew, this word that we see in Scripture, it actually means apartment, okay? And to top it off, it was actually an extension of his parents' house. Some of you are going, please don't let me marry a Jewish boy. It was called an insula, the family dwelling, and they would keep building onto it and building onto it. And what was crazy is the groom didn't even get to decide when it was finished. He had to wait for the father's okay, his stamp of approval. He was the one who said, all right, it's done. Go ahead, go get her. At which point he'd go get his groomsmen, right, and they'd march into her town. She wouldn't know the day, the time, or the hour. She'd just be waiting up every day like, this is the day. And they'd come in unannounced with their shofars, like little ram's horns, like a and they'd come into town, and she'd basically hear it and walk down the stairs and down the aisle, basically. Does this run in any parallels for you? Jesus says, this is my covenant, take and drink it. At which point he says, you know, the, the disciples say, well, we've been with him this long. He's crazy town. Let's see how far the rabbit hole goes, right? They say, I do. And then Jesus says, hey, we're not going to see each other for a while. And, but don't sweat it. My, my best man, my spirit, he's going to come and he's going to relay messages between you and me. That's how we'll communicate. In the meantime, you're going to go home and, and you're not going to know the day or the time or the hour that I come back for you. But you're going to be referred to as one who is bought with a price. In the meantime, I'm going to my father's house where there are many mansions. And I'm going to prepare one for you. And none of us know when it's going to be, but the father does. And when he tells me that it's finished, I'm going to get my posse, my groomsmen, the holy angels. They're going to blow their shofars, the four trumpets, and I'm going to come home and bring you home for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And what's unbelievable, if this weren't all enough, is that metaphorically Jesus is proposing to all of us. And he's not even proposing to a really great, amazing wife who's going to do all this amazing stuff for him. Scripture tells us that he brings this proposal to an adulterous, unfaithful wife. He calls us that in Hosea and Isaiah and Ezekiel, all over Scripture. So the issue isn't whether or not you're going to be the perfect bride. The issue is, will you take it? Will you drink it? Because the invitation is open. We studied another Hebrew custom of marriage that is important and relevant to us as the Bride of Christ concerning the Ketubah in the beginning of session three. But as a revision to set the stage for all I want to share in this message, I would like to read pages 69 and 70 from the Shema book about this. Jeremiah 31 verse 31 to 33 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke. Although I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law within them, and on their hearts will I write it. And I will be their God, and they will be my people. We need to understand this covenant that he has made with us. It is a new covenant likened to marriage. I have realized how much Abba Father speaks about weddings in his word, and I am starting to understand this new covenant better. It started becoming real to me because weddings are likened to our relationship with our first love, our bridegroom. He wants us to be in a marriage covenant with him where we are his people and he is our most high God. 
In Bible times, a young man desiring to be married would give the young lady that he hoped to be his bride a ketubah, which was a very beautiful covenant contract for marriage. It was written with great care and consideration and given to her at a special dinner planned by her family. Written on this ketubah covenant was this young man's heart's desire of how he loves and adores the young woman he hoped would be his bride, of his promises to her of all that he would be, and how he would protect and provide for her, as well as his likes and dislikes, his favorite foods, his highest ideals, his standard of living, how he wanted his house household run and his children raised. This covenant was basically the blueprint for the bride. When she was given the ketubah, the silver trumpets were blown and her suitor would pour a cup of the finest new wine for her, fresh fruit of the vine, the very best that money could buy, purchased at a sacrificial price. After pouring the cup, he would first take a sip then wait for her to take a sip. When she does, it signifies that she has accepted all that the covenant contains. She may not drink from it right away, for she takes the covenant agreement very seriously and knows that it's a commitment for life. She will go and read it carefully and study every word again, and she may study it for hours even into the night or until the next morning before she makes that commitment. Finally, if she agrees, she will take a sip and the betrothal is sealed and they are now bride and bridegroom and the silver trumpets are blown again, making the announcement to all. After the betrothal, they each return to their own father's home and don't see each other for the following year until the wedding day. During that year, he not only builds her a home, but he also supports her financially. And during this engagement period, she studies her covenant and she reads it over and over again. And she learns to cook his favorite foods, sing his favorite songs, and she studies the ketubah until she becomes the bride of his desire the mirror image of her covenant promise. In Ephesians 5, verse 25 to 27, it says, Husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word, that he might present the church to himself in glorious splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such things, that she might be holy and faultless. Abba has described our relationship with him as a covenantal one, and he describes his covenantal love as that of a husband. It is beautiful as you look at it from the perspective of a wedding in Bible times, because Yeshua came and fulfilled everything that the husband man would do to pursue the woman that he desired to be married to him. The ketubah that he has given to us as a covenant contract for this marriage relationship that he has purposed for us is his word. His word is our ketubah in which he tells us about all his likes and dislikes his desire for his people and his promises to his bride. This is what Yeshua is saying to his bride. My word is my heart revealed to you. I made my desires known to you through giving you my book as a covenant promise to show you how I want you to love. As you accept all that my covenant has to offer and you keep yourself holy 
and you study my ketubah, my desires and principles are written on your heart. When this bride accepts this ketubah, she won't go around playing the harlot with the unmarried ones because she has committed herself. When she agreed, she made a choice to set herself apart and study the ketubah because I went away to prepare a place for her and she is preparing herself for me through staying true to her commitment, keeping her promise and studying his heart's book. In this way, she truly becomes the mirror image of my desires. And when I return to her, I will find her prepared because she was faithful. Being in a covenant relationship with me is a commitment, a commitment of faithfulness. Have you accepted my ketubah, my covenant proposal unto you? I once had a dream about this topic and decided to reply to Yeshua, almost like a prophetic action, the way he wrote his ketubah to me. I replied to him, telling him that I delight in his covenant and that I commit myself to him with a first love heart. I told him that I wanted to be his bride and I wanted this marriage covenant with him. I signed the paper and I had communion. I believe that Abba is looking for people who delight in choosing him above all others and doing it wholeheartedly.
So the Ketubah marriage covenant contract that Jesus gave us, in which he shows us his likes and dislikes, and how he wants us to live, is his word. When God gave Moses the Ten Commandments on the two stone tablets on Mount Sinai, I personally used to imagine that Commandments 1 to 5 were written on the first stone tablet and Commandments 6 to 10 on the second stone tablet. But this is the value of understanding the Bible in its Hebrew context. Because when the man would present the ketubah to his bride-to-be, he would give it in two identical photocopies. One copy of the ketubah was for him, and one copy was for her. When God gave Moses the Ten Commandments on the two stone tablets, he wrote Commandments 1 to 10 on the one tablet, and Commandments 1 to 10 on the second tablet. So the stone tablets were identical photocopies of each other. And so what Abba Father was showing us in doing that is that his word is his ketubah marriage covenant to us. The ketubah is the blueprint for the bride. And just like the woman who was getting married would study her ketubah in her engagement period so that she would become the bride of her bridegroom's desire, whilst we are waiting for our wedding feast with our spiritual bridegroom Jesus, we are currently in our engagement period where we need to be studying his word so that we become the bride of his desire. Another interesting Hebrew custom of marriage that is important for us to understand is that during the engagement period, whilst the bride and bridegroom were separated, the woman would put a lamp on her windowsill, which she always kept lit, so that when her bridegroom came to get her, the first thing that he would look for is the lamp on her windowsill to see that it was lit because if it was lit, it meant she was ready and she was waiting for him. But if it was not lit, it meant that she was not ready or had lost interest and no longer wanted to marry him. So if she wanted to make sure that she was ready for the wedding feast, she had to make sure that her lamp was lit at all times during the engagement period. And because she didn't know exactly when her bridegroom was coming to get her, she had to have extra oil in storage so that she would stay ready for him at all times. And as we go through this session and the next one, we will see the relevance and importance of this in increasing layers and depths of revelation. In several of the sessions of the conference so far, I have introduced you to the patterns of seven in scripture. For example, the spiritual meaning and symbolism of the menorah, which has seven candles. And I shared how this relates to the sevenfold Holy Spirit and the seven colors of the rainbow, and mentioned how this is also linked to many other patterns of seven in scripture, such as the seven species of foods described in the promised land, the seven redemptive gifts, the seven churches of revelations, the seven days of creation, the seven stages of development of a baby in the womb, the seven items of furniture in the tabernacle, which all interconnects with the seven organ systems of the body, and the way that Abba Father designed the layers of our spirit and soul and the human body in patterns of seven. And recently, in session eight, part 10 and 11, we looked at how the enemy has strategically designed his army in a counterfeit pattern of seven to specifically inhibit and oppose each aspect of the patterns of seven 
in which our Father created us to flourish and blossom into the fullness that he designed for us spiritually and in our soul and body. But in this session, I would like to introduce and explain another pattern of seven to you, which is the seven biblical feasts. And the reason I am bringing them up now is because the time of three of the seven biblical feasts is coming up now, starting on the 6th of September in 2021. And so I wanted to share about it now so that you can prepare your heart for them and enjoy celebrating them with us. I would like to share with you some of the different layers of revelation of the meaning of the seven biblical feasts as they relate to our relationship with Jesus, our Messiah, Bridegroom and King. Because understanding and applying the spiritual principles that these feasts represent is going to bring a lot of spiritual richness to your life and it's going to show you how to be a ready and prepared bride for his return and it's going to lead you into healing and divine health and abundant life in absolutely every dimension and I'm going to show you how. The seven biblical feasts are tied into and interconnect with all the other patterns of seven in scripture. And so to see it in a picture, like the other patterns of seven, you can put the seven biblical feasts on the menorah, which I explained in session seven part two, is a key that Abba Father gave us in scripture to unlock a lot of revelation of his kingdom ways, principles and patterns which lead us into abundant life. In Leviticus chapter 23, God described the seven feasts that he desired for his people to celebrate, as well as the vital importance of the Sabbath. I explained the Sabbath in detail from both a medical and biblical perspective in session two, part 4.4, which is important background understanding because the Sabbath forms the foundation of the seven biblical feasts. Many people mistake the biblical feasts as only being relevant to the Jews. However, they are not Jewish feasts. In scripture, God said, these are my feasts. In other words, it's not a Jewish thing. It's a biblical thing. In Leviticus 23 verse 2, God said, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, Concerning the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. The seven biblical feasts and the Sabbath is not just for God's people in the Old Testament. It is still relevant to you and I as New Testament believers under the New Testament covenant provided by Jesus on the cross. The importance of the Sabbath is mentioned no less than 116 times in scripture in both the Old and New Testament. And that's the beauty of the internet today. Check me up on that. Type in Google 116 scriptures about the Sabbath and you will immediately have all of them listed at the tips of your fingers. Just as one example, Exodus 31 verse 16 says, Tell the people of Israel, be careful to keep my Sabbath day. For the Sabbath is a sign of the covenant between me and you throughout your generations, so that you may know without any doubt and acknowledge that I am the Lord who sanctifies you and sets you apart for myself. Note that in the scripture it said, throughout your generations. There is no generation where it stopped. It is a perpetual covenant. 
One of the major reasons the biblical feasts are relevant to us today as believers is because they are prophetically symbolic of Jesus' first and second coming. I'm going to show you how everything about these feasts is to do with Jesus, and therefore it has everything to do with us. Today in the world, we use the Gregorian calendar, which is based on the sun, because in ancient times, it was related to sun god worship, which is related to the occultic religion of Freemasonry. The Bible is based on a different calendar, which is related to the cycles of the moon. And by the way, the moon is symbolic of the bride. And you will see the beautiful relevance of that a little later. So because the Bible uses a different calendar to the one that we use in the world, the feasts don't fall on the same date of the calendar that we use every year. There are seven biblical feasts. The first four feasts are at the beginning of the year, and the last three feasts is at the end of the year. The four feasts at the beginning of the year are prophetically symbolic of Jesus' first coming. They occur in the March-April period during the Hebrew month called Nisan. The first feast is Passover, which is Pesach in Hebrew. Everything that takes place in the process of the Passover meal is symbolic of Jesus dying on the cross for us and he was crucified on the day of Passover at the exact time of the day that they would sacrifice the Passover lamb, therefore fulfilling what the Passover feast prophetically symbolizes. Jesus was the spotless Passover lamb that paid the price on our behalf. The second biblical feast is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This is prophetically symbolic of when Jesus was buried for three days. And once again, Jesus was buried during the exact time of the Feast of Unleavened Bread as a fulfillment of that feast. The third feast is the Feast of First Fruits. And this is prophetically symbolic of when Jesus rose again which he did on this very day as the first fruits of many to come, which is you and me, as explained in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20. The fourth feast is Pentecost, which is Shavuot in Hebrew. This is prophetically symbolic of when the Holy Spirit descended with tongues of fire on the disciples in the upper room which again took place on this exact day. 3,000 years earlier to the day, before the day of Pentecost where the Holy Spirit descended on the disciples, Moses was on Mount Sinai, where God gave Moses the Ketubah marriage covenant, which was his word or his law with the Ten Commandments on each of the stone tablets as an exact identical photocopy of each other. But whilst God was in the process of proposing to his people and giving them his Ketubah marriage covenant, they were busy committing adultery in spiritual fornication where they were busy worshipping a golden calf. And when Moses came down the mountain and saw this, he smashed the stone tablets and that was like God in his grief, tearing up the marriage covenant contract. And that day, 3,000 people died because of their disobedience and rebellion. 3,000 years later, exactly to the day, it is the Feast of Pentecost, which is Shavuot in Hebrew, where the Holy Spirit descends on the disciples in Acts chapter 2, and they are filled with boldness, and they witness to the people, and 3,000 people 
got born again. That was a redemption of the 3,000 people that had died on that day 3,000 years earlier. Isn't it amazing how every detail in scripture has significance? So on the feast of Shavuot or Pentecost, God gave us his word and his Holy Spirit. So with regards to the long-term debate in the body of Christ about grace versus the law, the answer is we need both. It's like rowing in a canoe. If you only row with your right hand, you're going to go in circles. If you only row with your left hand, you are also going to go in circles. So you need both in order to move forward. In the same way, we need both God's word and the Holy Spirit. We can't just have the law or God's word without the Holy Spirit, because 2 Corinthians 3 verse 6 says that the letter of the law kills, but the spirit brings life. Just the law or God's word without the Holy Spirit will just bring death and the bondage of legalism. But you can't just have the Holy Spirit without the word because that is lawlessness. And we've seen the consequences of the curses and diseases and bondages that come as a result of disobedience to his word. So at the fourth feast of Shavuot or Pentecost, we celebrate receiving God's word and his Holy Spirit. Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread has a spiritual principle embedded into it, which is an essential key to becoming the bride. And that is the importance of crucifying the flesh and dying to self. In Matthew 16, verse 24, Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you want to come with me, you must forget yourself, carry your cross, and follow me. Other translations say, deny yourself and pick up your cross daily. This is talking about dying to self. Dying to self means that we no longer live for ourselves. In terms of the temporary pleasures of the flesh, and a worldly lifestyle of compromise and lukewarmness. Dying to self in the context of relationships, for example, means not reacting according to the impulses of the flesh. For example, anger and hurt and bitterness and unforgiveness and strife and fighting back and repaying evil with evil and so on. And instead, crucifying the flesh and choosing to walk in the fruits of the Holy Spirit and instead of operating out of selfishness, operating out of love. You see, the more the flesh in us increases, the more the Holy Spirit in us decreases. And in the same way, the more the flesh in us decreases, the more the Holy Spirit can increase. In other words, the more of self and the flesh we have in us, the more the Holy Spirit in us is going to be stifled and the more desensitized we will become to the Spirit. But the more that we are emptied of self in the flesh, the more the Holy Spirit can operate in our lives. Scripture explains that we cannot bear the fruits of the Holy Spirit in our life until we have died to self and crucified the flesh. In John 12, verse 24, Jesus said, I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just one grain, and it never becomes more, but lives by itself alone. But if it dies, it produces many others and yields a rich harvest. Remember, Passover was when Jesus was crucified, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread was when he was buried. This picture of putting a seed in the ground, which has to die, is a parallel of Jesus dying on the cross and being buried in the earth, which in turn 
is also symbolic of what Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread represents for us spiritually, where we need to crucify the flesh and die to self so that we can produce a fruitful harvest in our lives of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And I just want to briefly mention here, whilst we have the scripture fresh in our minds, which says that a seed or a grain of wheat needs to die before it produces a harvest, is that there are seven food species of Israel, which God mentioned in Deuteronomy 8 verse 8, which he told Moses and the Israelites was in the promised land that he was leading them into. He said that it was a land of wheat, barley, vines, which is grapes, fig trees, pomegranates, olives and olive oil, and honey, which is not honey made by bees, it is date honey. And when I personally went to Israel, I tasted it and it's absolutely delicious. These seven species of food in Israel interconnects with and coincides with all the other patterns of seven in scripture, including the seven biblical feasts. Each of these seven species of Israel is extremely healthy and beneficial to the human body in terms of the nutrients that they provide. But there are also spiritual principles for our life represented by each of these seven species of Israel that is connected to the same spiritual principles and prophetic meaning of each of the seven biblical feasts. And in Israel, each of these seven species matures to bear fruit and a harvest at the time of the specific biblical feast that they are connected to. And the point of significance that I want to bring out here is that the wheat harvest coincides with the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is about dying to self and being dead to sin and the flesh. When wheat is ready for harvest, it looks like this where its head has bowed which signifies where we have bowed before Abba Father, where we have humbled ourselves before him through dying to self. This is where we have removed the pride of life that 1 John 2 verse 16 speaks of. The pride of life or pride is where we live for ourselves. It's where we exalt ourselves above him for the temporary pleasures of this world and the things of the flesh. Dying to self is where the bride bows in worship and humbles herself before Abba Father, as we see pictured by the wheat harvest at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, where the wheat has bowed its head. We see this principle of dying to self as a critical key to becoming the bride, even in the name of Yahweh, which I explained in session eight, part three, is a written marriage covenant between Jesus and his bride. Remember that to spell God's name in Hebrew, it goes like this. Yud, Hey. Vav, Hey, which in English is Yahweh. Now the Hebrew language can be written in letters like this, Yud Hey, Vav Hey, or in numbers, which is the number that that Hebrew letter appears in the order of the Hebrew alphabet. And it can also be represented by pictures. The picture associated with the letter Yud is an arm, which represents the strength and power of God 
and all that he is. The letter Vav is a nail. So to put what these pictures say together so far, it says God who was nailed to a cross. The hay is a picture of a bride with her arms lifted up in worship. So God's name in picture form says, God who was nailed to a cross to call forth a worshiping bride. When Jesus was crucified, scripture says that there was a sign that was nailed to the cross above him with the accusation for which he was crucified, which said Jesus, King of the Jews. This was written in the form of a Hebrew acronym, which when put together, spelled yud Vavhei. vav -Hey. So God's name, Yahweh, or Yahweh, was on the sign above Jesus when he was crucified. And when the Pharisees suddenly realized it, they said, no, take that down. But Pilate said, it's too late. That's what it says, and you will leave it that way. So we see our marriage covenant in writing in his name, which was above his head, when Jesus was crucified and died on the cross, as he had his bride on his mind, as he chose to lay down his life in his great love for her. After that revision, this is what I would like to show you now. Why are there two letters of hay representing the bride in God's name? What does this mean? Well, if you combine the two letters of Yud and He, it spells the Hebrew word Yah, which means image of God. I've explained extensively in the previous sessions of the conference how the story of Moses and the Israelites parallels our spiritual journey with God and how our father is calling his people out of Egypt and all that it represents in terms of the ways of the world and all the bondage and slavery that sin takes us into. And he is leading us to go on an exodus journey through the desert back to the garden, which represents the sanctification journey of repentance and renewing our minds so that we can be restored to how he originally created us to be in the garden, where we walk according to his image, so that we can be fruitful. Abba Father has always desired for his bride to walk in his image, which is reflected through the fruits of the Holy Spirit as his character is cultivated and manifested in our character and lifestyle. But we have to be emptied of the flesh and of self before we can walk in the fruits of the Holy Spirit and reflect his image. And that is the other part of Yahweh's name. In order to be transformed into his image, the bride, the hay, has to pass through the vav, representing the nail on the cross, where we crucify the flesh and die to self, so that we can be transformed back into his image, and so that we are a mirror reflection of who he is. The seed of wheat has to be buried and die in order to produce a harvest of fruit. And in the same way, as the wheat bows its head, so the bride of Christ has to bow down in worship and die to self and crucify the flesh, which is what taking up our cross daily means, so that we can produce a harvest of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. 
and the biblical feasts guide us through this process. Where just as Jesus was crucified on Passover, so we also take up our cross and crucify the flesh. And just as Jesus was buried in the tomb during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we die to self so that we can walk in his image, which is reflected through the fruits of the Holy Spirit in our character and life, which is the harvest in us that he has always desired. This whole process is also represented when we are baptized in water, where we identify ourselves with what Jesus did on the cross, where we crucify the flesh, and where we go under the water, representing being buried with him as we die to self and become dead to sin. And like he rose on the feast of first fruits, as we come out of the water, we are raised up with him, washed in the water of the word, where we have renewed our minds and have been transformed back into his image. And as Paul said in Galatians 2 verse 20, my old self has been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in and through me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The desperate prayer of my heart for me personally this year, in my daily prayer life, and in my own personal relationship with Abba Father and Yeshua as my bridegroom, has been to give thanksgiving in faith, where I have prayed and I'm still praying in faith and trusting him, saying, thank you, Abba Father, for changing me in your presence as a work of your Holy Spirit where the flesh in me has been fully and completely crucified. Thank you, Abba Father, that I have died to self and that I no longer live for myself. Thank you for helping me and giving me the grace to no longer exalt myself above you with any temporary pleasures of this world or of the flesh. Thank you, Abba Father, for doing a work in me as a work of your Holy Spirit and for removing the pride of life from me. And thank you for helping me to be like wheat at the time of harvest, to humble myself and bow before you as your worshiping bride. Thank you, Abba Father, for filling me with the same love that Yeshua had for me that led him to lay down his life for me. And thank you, Abba Father, that you filled me with that same love for him so that I in turn will lay down my life for him through dying to self and crucifying the flesh so that truly it is no longer I who lives but Yeshua who lives in and through me. It's a picture of the most beautiful divine romance between Yeshua and his bride, where they both love each other so much that they lay down their lives for each other. So this means that we no longer live for ourselves. And this is also represented in the story of Moses, when God appeared to him as a burning fire in the bush, and Moses had to take off his shoes to stand on holy ground. In Romans 12 verse 1 it says, I appeal to you therefore brethren and beg you in view of all the mercies of God to make a decisive dedication of your body, presenting all your members, members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. The spiritual principle pictured in Moses taking off his shoes to stand on holy ground is of us choosing to take off our self shoes and no longer live for ourselves so that we can be a burning bush and a living sacrifice. 
which is represented in the biblical feast of Shavuot or Pentecost, where like the burning bush with Moses, flames of fire descended on the disciples and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. When the bride has been emptied of self and is a cleansed and sanctified vessel, after applying the spiritual principles represented in Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread and First Fruits, the next feast is Shavuot or Pentecost, where she is filled with the Holy Spirit and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, which is what the olive oil in the seven species of Israel represents and why it is connected to the Feast of Shavuot or Pentecost. So as you can see from these first four biblical feasts, the biblical feasts are leading us on a spiritual journey with Abba Father to becoming his bride. Now let's have a look at the last three biblical feasts because this is where the journey gets exciting. The three feasts at the end of the year are prophetically symbolic of Jesus' second coming. They occur during the September-October period, during the seventh month in the biblical calendar, which in Hebrew is called Tishri. The fifth feast is the Feast of Trumpets, which is Yom Teruah in Hebrew. This year, in 2021, it starts at sunset on Monday, the 6th of September, and it ends at sunset on Wednesday, the 8th of September. The reason these feasts start at sunset is because remember in session 2, part 4.4, on the Sabbath day of rest, I explained that in the biblical way of tracking time, the beginning of the day is at sunset. The Feast of Trumpets, or Yom Teruah, is prophetically symbolic of when Jesus comes to fetch his bride and the angels blow their trumpets and take us to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The angels blowing their shofars or their trumpets is why it is called the Feast of Trumpets. Whenever you see the word trumpet in scripture, it is referring to the blowing of the shofar. Now remember in the video by Mike Donahay that you watched at the beginning of the session where he explained the customs of a Hebrew wedding, the bridegroom blows a trumpet or shofar when he comes with his best men into the town at an unexpected time, like a thief in the middle of the night, to fetch his bride-to-be for their wedding. This Hebrew custom of the bridegroom and his best men blowing the shofars is a foreshadow of the Feast of Trumpets, where the angels coming with Jesus will blow the trumpets and that awesome sound will be audibly heard throughout the earth. This time when Jesus comes to fetch his bride is commonly referred to as the rapture. You don't find the word rapture in the Bibles that we have today, but its reality is more deeply understood when you understand the Hebrew customs of marriage, which has the ultimate purpose of helping us understand everything surrounding Jesus coming to fetch his bride in the end times. And when you understand that, you're going to see it in scripture more and more. And I'm going to continue to explain this in this session. We see the rapture described, for example, in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 52, which says, it will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trump is blown. For when the trump sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever, and we who are living will also be transformed. In other translations, like the King James Version, it says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, 
at the last trump, for the trump shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. So scripture says that it will happen in a flash or in the twinkling of an eye. In other words, it's going to happen very, very quickly. Where those who are part of the bride of Christ will literally physically disappear from this earth in split seconds as Jesus comes to fetch his bride to take her away for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And as it says in the scripture, in this moment, our bodies will be transformed from our physical body to our renewed body in the spirit, which is incorruptible. In other words, a spirit body. To explain it in simpler English, it is where we physically transfer from the physical realm of this world into the spiritual realm where Jesus is to be with him. It's a very privileged time to be alive because all the scriptural signs are here that indicates that we are the most likely generation to experience this. And it's going to be one of the most exciting, profound moments for those who are ready and are part of the Bride of Christ. We can't imagine that moment with our natural minds but to give you a glimpse, imagine your body being filled with light as your body is changed and transformed into a spirit body in that split second. And imagine hearing the awesome audible trumpet sound of the shofar that sounds like this. <laughs>
Jesus comes to fetch his bride for the marriage supper of the Lamb, he also said in Scripture that he would come at an unexpected time like a thief in the night. For example, 2 Peter 3 verse 10 says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. In Revelation 16 verse 15, Jesus warned, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake. Jesus also said that he would come to fetch us at a day or hour that no one knows. Now, this is where we see the importance of understanding the Bible in its Hebrew context. Because if you just read that from an English perspective, for example, you will think that Jesus was saying that nobody knows when he's coming back. But in the Hebrew culture, the Feast of Trumpets was also referred to as the day or hour that no one knows. Because in those days, they didn't have NASA and the technology of satellites and so on that we have today. And so they didn't know exactly which night there would be a new moon, which signals the start of the Feast of Trumpets. It could be one of two nights. So the priest would have to go outside at night and literally physically look at the moon. And if he could verify that there was a new moon, he would blow the shofar, signaling the start of the Feast of Trumpets. So since they were not sure exactly which night the Feast of Trumpets would start, the Feast of Trumpets was nicknamed the day or hour that no one knows. So when Jesus said that he's coming on the day or hour that no one knows, he was basically telling us exactly when he is coming. He is coming on the Feast of Trumpets to fetch his bride, although we don't know exactly what year this will be, and so we need to stay ready. The Feast of Trumpets starts on a new moon, and a new moon is where there's no moon. And then over the month, the moon progresses to a, a thin sliver of the moon in the sky, and then to half a moon, and then eventually a full moon. The moon is symbolic of the bride who reflects the sun's light. In session seven, part two, I shared in detail how the golden menorah of the tabernacle is symbolic of the bride of Christ who is shining a light where she walks in the image of God in the way that she thinks, speaks and lives and therefore demonstrates the image of God and who God is through her life to those around her. In session eight, part six, I spoke in detail about linen and how this is also related to the bride. For example, Revelations 19 verse eight describes the bride as wearing white linen garments when Jesus returns. And I shared how even on a physical level, Linen fibers in linen material have a unique quality where they reflect light. The moon is also symbolic of this in terms of representing the bride who reflects the sun's light. The significance of the Feast of Trumpets starting on a new moon, where the moon disappears from the earth and is only visible to the sun, S-U-N, is again symbolic of the rapture, where on the Feast of Trumpets, the bride will disappear from the earth and be seen only by the sun, S-O-N. Just like Jesus fulfilled the feast at the beginning of the year, exactly to the day with his first coming, so he will also fulfill the feasts at the end of the year exactly to the day with his second coming. The sounding of the shofars at the Feast of Trumpets is a sound that is meant as an alarm to awaken a sleeping bride, which is the church in spiritual slumber, to prepare for the coming of our bridegroom and king through repentance and sanctification of our heart, through renewing our mind, with the word of God. 
The sixth biblical feast is the Day of Atonement, which is called Yom Kippur in Hebrew. In 2021, it will begin at sunset on Wednesday, the 15th of September, and it ends at sunset on Thursday, the 16th of September. All the other feasts are happy times of music and dancing and feasting and celebration. But the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, is the most serious day of the year, where God's people fast for 24 hours and seek God in repentance, because this day is prophetically symbolic of when God's judgment will hit the earth. It is referred to in scripture as the great and terrible day of the Lord. For example, in Joel chapter 2. This is where a series of catastrophic events will hit the earth and take place one after the other in this 24 hour period as revealed by the seven trumpets of revelations, which is another pattern of sevens in scripture, which I will explain in another session. Around this time, the time of grace will come to an end. There will be great tribulation on the earth, which Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 21, will be worse than has ever been seen in history before. On Yom Kippur in Israel, there was an unbelievable amount of blood that was shed in the Old Testament as they did animal sacrifices to atone for their sins. Jesus' blood shed on the cross was the ultimate fulfillment for the atonement of our sins, but it is applied to our lives through repentance, which is the emphasis of the Day of Atonement. All the bloodshed that the Day of Atonement is symbolic of in the Old Testament during this feast, the tribulation in the end times, as well as the blood of Jesus, is why the grapes in the seven species of Israel is specifically linked to this biblical feast and the spiritual principles it represents. Because grape juice represents blood, for example, like we see when we take communion, where we apply the blood of Jesus to our lives through repentance. There are over a hundred scriptures in the Bible that mention the Lamb's Book of Life. When we accept what Jesus did on the cross and become born again, our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Leading up to the Day of Atonement is what is called the Ten Days of Awe, which is named this because when these feasts are fulfilled in the end times, these will be the last ten days where a person has the opportunity to repent and have their name written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the books are closed and there is judgment. The Day of Atonement also represents Jesus' second return with his worshipping warrior bride in his army after the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is where Jesus comes to defeat the Antichrist at the Battle of Armageddon in the Jezreel Valley in Israel, and to remove Satan from the earth, and thus the removal of sin, which is the ultimate fulfillment of atonement. Let's just take three minutes to picture this magnificent moment in history of Jesus coming back on his white horse with his worshipping warrior bride in heaven's armies that are riding with him. And as you listen to this music, hear the horse's hooves of heaven's armies as it builds up in the music that is playing. See him on his white horse. Ready for battle and he's calling his troops.
is mine, says the Lord. Follow me. The battle is the Lord's. Lord, we praise you. All glory and all honor belong to the King of Kings. Your kingdom come, your will be done. O sovereign of the nations. The seventh feast is the Feast of Tabernacles, which is called Sakot in Hebrew. In 2021, it will begin at sunset on Monday, the 20th of September, and it carries on for seven days until it ends at sunset on Monday, the 27th of September. The Hebrew word in scripture for tabernacle is Mishkan. And I'm just mentioning this so that you know what Lisa is referring to in a song she will soon sing, so that when she sings the word Mishkan, you can understand that this is the tabernacle. In Exodus 24 verse 8, God explained that his purpose for the tabernacle was so that he can dwell amongst us. Everything that the Israelites did in the physical was a symbolic picture of the principles of his kingdom that Abba Father designed for our lives spiritually. When we become born again, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of us, and as 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 to 20 says, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are now living tabernacles who are filled with the Spirit and presence of God. And in the new millennium, Jesus will physically dwell amongst us here on earth, which is what the Feast of Tabernacles is a celebration of, where Jesus will tabernacle with his bride, who has now become his queen after the marriage supper of the Lamb has taken place. In the seven species of Israel, the pomegranate is related to the Feast of Tabernacles, because we see in many places in Scripture, for example, Song of Solomon 7 verse 12, that the pomegranate is used as a prophetic reference to the bride. For example, the pomegranate is the only fruit with a crown. It consists of lots of seeds covered in red, symbolic of the bride being made up of individual people covered in the blood of the Lamb. The seeds are in pockets, symbolic of the remnant bride, consisting of pockets of people throughout the earth. And amazingly, the pomegranate has 613 seeds, 
which is a link to the Word of God, which has 613 commandments or instructions that lead us into God's kingdom ways. And this is symbolic of the Shema lifestyle of the bride who listens to and obeys his word. So pomegranates are linked to the Feast of Tabernacles because it is symbolic of the bride who becomes Yeshua's queen, his wife, in the new millennium. The Feast of Tabernacles represents the start of the new millennium, where Jesus will physically tabernacle with us here on earth, which means that he will live with and dwell amongst us, and we will ru rule and reign on earth together with him for a thousand years. Remember that scripture says that God created the earth in six days, and then he rested on the seventh day. 2 Peter 3 verse 8 says that with the Lord one day resembles a thousand years, and a thousand years resembles a day. Just as six days was given to work, so God has given six thousand years for mankind on earth. And just as God rested on the seventh day, after six days of work, after six thousand years are up, so we also will enjoy a millennium rest with him for a thousand years, making a total of seven thousand years, which is linked to the seven days of the week. This millennial final thousand years of rest is the ultimate fulfillment of the Sabbath day of rest on the seventh day, which is why the foundation of the feasts is the Sabbath as I mentioned in the beginning. After the final 1,000 years of rest, which makes a total of 7,000 years, Scripture says that heaven and this earth will pass away and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. I want to come before you in my time of need. I want to let down all I am and all that I am Take up my cross and die to sell Cause I am not my own You have bought me with the highest price Through giving me your life Resurrect my soul in truth as I die to every lie Resurrect my soul in faith As I die to every fear I cast on the serpent's stuff I take off my new garment As a pure bride As a pure bride No more do I choose To exalt Myself above you through living for any temporary satisfaction. You have awakened my ears to hear through the trumpet sound. You have awakened my heart to see through your mishkan. Resurrect my soul in truth as I die. Resurrect my soul in faith As I die to every fear I cast out the serpent's stuff I take off my new garment As a pure bride As a pure bride And I will journey with you From trumpets to tabernacle From where Resurrect my soul in faith 
as I die to every fear. I cast down the serpent stuff. I take up my new garment as a peer bride, as a peer bride. Resurrect my soul in truth as I die to every lie. Resurrect my soul in faith as I die to every fear. I cast down. Serpent stuff, I take up my new garment as a peer bride, as a peer bride, as a peer bride, as a peer bride. I've mentioned several times in this conference that the tabernacle is a blueprint for how God designed the human body. I've also mentioned previously that the seven pieces of furniture in the tabernacle coincides with the seven organ systems of the body. Now I want to show you how the way that Abba Father designed the human body in creation is also linked to the seven biblical feasts, just like the other patterns of seven. I'm going to give you one brief example about how the seven biblical feasts ties in with the gestation period, which is the development of a baby in the womb. Leviticus 23 verse 5 says that Passover is on the 14th day of the first month. In a woman's menstrual cycle, ovulation takes place on the 14th day of her monthly cycle. In other words, this is when the female egg is released from the ovary. And it's interesting to note that one of the customary things to have on the table in a Passover meal is an egg. Leviticus 23 verse 6 says that the Feast of Unleavened Bread is on the 15th day of the same month, which is the day after Passover. In the same way, the female egg needs to be fertilized by a male sperm within 24 hours, otherwise it will pass on. Children are the fruit of the womb. Spiritually, this is connected to the fact that Abba Father has designed us to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The sperm entering the female ovum to fertilize it is a picture of putting a seed in the ground. Remember in scripture it says, unless a seed or grain falls to the ground and dies, it cannot produce a harvest. Regarding our spiritual walk, this alludes to the fact that we cannot bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our character and life unless we die to self. So just as Jesus was buried in the tomb during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, in our spiritual journey, we too need to go through the process of dying to self so that we can be fruitful. And we see this parallel even in the development of a baby in the womb as it coincides with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Leviticus 23 verse 7 to 8 says that the Feast of First Fruits is observed between two and six days after Passover. Within two to six days, implantation takes place, where the fertilized egg attaches itself to the wall of the womb and begins to grow. Leviticus 23 verse 15 to 16 explains that Pentecost is celebrated 50 days after Passover. In Greek, pent means 50. Around the 50th day, based on the DNA received from the parents, the embryo starts to take on the form of a human being. Before that, it doesn't look like a baby. But now, at this point, you can see a head, 
eyes, hands, fingers, legs, feet, toes, and so on, as shown in the picture on the screen. Remember that on Pentecost, Moses received the instructions of God's word, which is God's DNA, so that we can walk in his image and look like him in the way that we think, speak, and act. Leviticus 23 verse 24 says that the Feast of Trumpets is celebrated on the first day of the seventh month. On the first day of the seventh month in pregnancy, the baby's hearing is developed. And for the first time, it can hear and distinguish sounds outside the womb. Symbolically, at the Feast of Trumpets, is when we will first hear the audible sounds of heaven when the trumpets blow. Remember also that the sounding of the shofars at the Feast of Trumpets is the warning sound of the bridegroom's voice, calling his bride who is spiritually sleeping to awaken and prepare for his return. Leviticus 23 verse 24 says, that the Day of Atonement is celebrated on the 10th day of the seventh month. And remember, this was a day in the Old Testament where there was a lot of blood being shed as they were making their sacrifices as they repented to atone for their sins. And this was when the blood was taken into the Holy of Holies. On the 10th day of the seventh month, the hemoglobin of the blood changes from that of the mother to a self-sustaining baby. Leviticus 23 verse 24 says that the Feast of Tabernacles is celebrated on the 15th day of the seventh month. On the 15th day of the seventh month, which is when the baby is now 28 weeks, the lungs become fully developed and can sustain life. If born before then, the baby would have a hard time breathing. Remember that the Feast of Tabernacles is a time of celebrating the fact that Jesus will tabernacle with us and that we are living tabernacles. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is tabernacling with us or living inside of us. In the New Testament, the Greek term pneuma normally translated as breath, is also translated as Holy Spirit. So we can see how this correlates with the development of the lungs. There is an eighth feast called the Feast of Hanukkah, which is celebrated on the 10th day of the ninth month. This is also called the Feast of Lights or the Feast of Dedication. We see Jesus observing this feast in the New Testament in John 10 verse 22. This feast commemorates the time when the second temple was built where a miracle took place. They wanted to dedicate the second temple on the same day that the first temple was dedicated, but they only had enough olive oil to burn in the menorah of the temple for one day. It would take eight days to make new oil in the way that it needed to be properly prepared according to God's instructions in scripture, which meant that they would be short of oil for seven days. They decided to dedicate the temple on the appropriate day anyway and lit the menorah, which miraculously burned for eight days on oil that would normally only last for 24 hours. Therefore, to celebrate this miracle, at the Feast of Hanukkah, they have special menorahs that have eight candles instead of the normal seven candles, and they light a candle each day until all eight candles are burning on the eighth day. Guess what happens on the tenth day of the ninth month? The birth of the baby takes place. This corresponds with the Feast of Hanukkah, which takes place nine months and ten days after Passover. The biblical spiritual meaning 
of the number seven is perfect completion. And the number eight means the start or birth of a new beginning. Remember that the seventh Feast of Tabernacles represents the final 1,000 years to complete 7,000 years, and then there is a new beginning represented by the eighth feast, which is where there is a new heaven and a new earth. And we see the connection of this even in creation with the birth of the baby. 5,000 years ago, man could not have known the scientific detail of the gestation period that we now understand today. The correlation of the seven biblical feasts with the human gestation period, as well as in agriculture with the seven species of Israel, is not only remarkable, but it proves intelligent design. It proves the existence of an intelligence beyond this world, and it reveals the fingerprint of God on creation and on the human body and shows us that the biblical feasts are not a man-made religious thing. The establishment of the feasts, which are holy days, was given to Moses by God himself. Allow me 10 minutes to show you another incredibly remarkable link of the pattern of sevens between the seven days that God created the earth and how he created the development of a baby in the womb. Here, Dr. Franz Cronier shares. Most discussions about creation versus evolution focus primarily on either supporting or refuting the quantity of time or the probability of chance being involved in the process. My purpose is to deviate from this by directing our attention on a particular pattern or fractal in Scripture for which Genesis 1 provides the blueprint and to show how human embryology conforms to this pattern. Those like myself who hold the view that man's presence on earth and his destiny are framed within the larger context of a loving and actively involved creator for the purpose of cultivating our capacity for relationship and our responsibility may expect to be strengthened in their belief. Those who negate this possibility and favor rote mechanism and chance may nevertheless be intrigued by the parallelism between the story of creation and the various epochs in human embryology. Either way, I believe it will be fruitful to study the development of human life with an understanding of this pattern. The conclusions may not be the same, but the pursuit of truth is never wasted if embarked upon with a willingness to go where the evidence leads. Scripture is replete with circular imprints of time made up in units of seven. We could think of these as a week and therefore there is a week of days which makes up the Sabbath cycle, the seven week of weeks which is the time between Passover and Pentecost, there is the week of months which makes up the seven months leading up to the Feast of Tabernacles. There is the week of years, which makes up the sabbatical year cycle. And finally, there is the week of weeks of years, which makes up the Jubilee cycle. On top of this, in terms of the history of mankind, we could also consider the week of millennia, which leads up to the millennial kingdom cycle. So sevens are an important structure and process that we find throughout Scripture. For the remainder of this presentation, I will be contrasting the themes that are captured in the creation narrative in Genesis 1 from the King James Bible with the first seven weeks of human embryological development. The human embryology is standardized, but I will be using Moore and Persaud's Developing Human 7th Edition published in 2001. In the Genesis account, the first day of creation separates light and darkness. The second day separates the waters from the waters. The third day, dry land appears as well as the associated vegetation. Day four introduces the various celestial bodies that govern time. On the fifth day, we have the appearance of fish and birds. On the sixth day, 
all animals that creep as well as man. And on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there is rest and fulfillment. So with that metric, let us now explore how this relates to the developing human. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Genesis 1, verse 1 to 3. This is a summary of the first week of embryological development. It starts with fertilization and ends with implanting in the womb. As we know, DNA is actually bioluminescent. In other words, it forms and emits light. This is the formation of light. And so, the first day of creation is in some respects paralleled by particularly the first day of the first week of embryological development. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Genesis 1 verse 6, King James Version. This is the second week of embryological development. And on the first day of the second week, the amnion cavity appears, literally the waters above the waters. Therefore, day two, the separation of waters, is parallel with week two, the formation of the amnion cavity. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let dry land appear. And it was so. Genesis 1 verse 9, King James Version. The first day of the third week of embryological development sees the formation of mesoderm. Mesoderm is not in contact with either of the watery cavities of the embryo, and therefore is literally dry land. And so, day three, the formation of dry land, is mirrored by the first day of week three, the formation of mesoderm. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. Genesis 1, 14 to 15, King James Version. This is the fourth week of embryological development, and it starts with heartbeat, the introduction of time into the human embryo. Therefore, day four governance of time corresponds with the first day of week four, heartbeat. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature, fish, that hath life, and fowl, or birds, that may fly upon the earth and in the open firmament of heaven. Genesis 1 verse 20, King James Version. This is week 5 of embryological development, and it starts with the formation of gill slits and primitive paddles or wings. Therefore, day 5 of creation, the formation of fish and birds, corresponds with the first day of week 5 of embryological development, the formation of gill slits and wings. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after his kind, cattle and creeping things, and the beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion. Genesis 1 verse 24 to 31 King James Version. And so we see in week 6 of the development of the embryo the formation of the limbs and special senses. In other words, the equipment that allows creatures to have dominion upon the earth. Therefore, day 6, the formation of animals and man corresponds with week 6, the formation of limbs and senses. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, 
because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Genesis 2 verse 1 to 3 King James Version This is a summary of the seventh week of embryological development and it sees the formation of eyelids and genitals, rest and fulfillment. And so day seven, the formation of the day of rest and fulfillment is paralleled by embryological week seven, the formation of eyelids and genitals. This is an extract from Psalm 139, verse 13 to 16, literal version. In it, King David describes the formation of the human embryo and fetus. The language is so accurate that it is extraordinary and reflects our current understanding of human embryology. For you've possessed my inward parts. You wove me in the womb of my mother. I will thank you, for with awesome ways I am distinguished. Your works are marvelous, and my soul knows it very well. My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in secret, when I was woven in the depths of the earth, a reference to the uterus. Your eyes saw my embryo, literally unformed mass. And in your book all my members were written, the days they were formed, and not one was yet among them. I hope that this short overview of human embryology as compared to the days of creation will inspire you, intrigue you, or at least lead to some curiosity. I encourage you to look further, to study further, and to pursue the truth. So through the biblical feasts, which we see encoded in the development of the baby in the womb, its correlation to the seven days of creation, the seven species of Israel, and many other patterns of seven in scripture, we see the fingerprint of God on creation in terms of how all his scriptural patterns of seven interconnect. But the purpose of these patterns of seven is to reveal to us a lifestyle of his kingdom principles that leads us into abundant life in every dimension that he created us. The seven biblical feasts are very relevant to health because keeping the biblical feasts has massive health benefits. Understanding the spiritual principles that the feasts represent and applying it to your life is God's genius lifestyle roadmap to keep us in divine health. For example, before the Feast of Trumpets, a key spiritual principle as it approaches and you are preparing your heart for it is that this time serves as a reminder to have a look at all of your relationships and look for where there is relationship breakdowns, where you have been hurt or offended, or if you hurt or offended somebody else. And in Israel today, they phone people that they have relationship breakdowns with, or go and see them, and they make right with each other. And you know from previous teachings in session eight of the online conference, that restoring relationships with others through forgiveness has massive health benefits. For example, it can prevent cancer and lead to the healing of cancer. At the time of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, God's people eat matzah, which is like a wafer biscuit that has burnt patches on it and holes in it. This is symbolic of what Jesus did on the cross, where the burnt patches represent how he was bruised for our guilt and iniquities and the holes represent how he was pierced for our transgressions, as it says in Isaiah 53, verse 5. Matzah is eaten during the time of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, because in Exodus 12, verse 15, Abba Father told the people to eat unleavened bread in this time, because leaven, or the yeast in bread, which makes the bread puff up, 
is symbolic of sin and pride that puffs us up. And he said in this time that they must search their houses for the presence of any leaven in it. The spiritual principle this represents is that Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a time where we are reminded to search our hearts for sin. And during this time, they do things that symbolize this. For example, the women give their houses a thorough spring clean just before Passover, and the children play games as part of having fun as a family in this time, where they go through the house with a feather and search for any crumbs or dirt, symbolizing searching our hearts for sin in this time. In Luke 22, verse 7 to 23, when Jesus celebrated the Passover meal with his disciples, the night before he was crucified, which is the Last Supper, he introduced communion. Both Passover and communion represents what Jesus did on the cross. The wine or grape juice in communion represents the blood of Jesus, which he shed so that we could be forgiven when we apply his blood to our lives through repentance. The bread in communion represents our healing, which comes from renewing our mind with the word of God, which is the bread of life. Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a time where we need to apply in practice what communion represents to our lives. This is an annual appointed time that Abba Father set in place for us to go to Dr. God for a heart checkup and allow him to x-ray our hearts spiritually so that he can show us what is inside. And as we allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts and show us where there is sin in our lives, we need to respond to that by applying the blood of Jesus through repentance and the word of God, which is the bread of life, and renew our minds in each area that the Holy Spirit shows us. For example, if the Holy Spirit shows you that you have fear in certain areas of your life, then you apply the blood of Jesus by repenting of those specific fears, and you use the word of God to renew your mind, to retrain yourself to think like God thinks in that area, so that you no longer have the thinking patterns of that specific fear. And in this way, you are putting the spiritual principles of what Passover and communion represents into practice in your life personally. And I have shown in great detail through the sessions of this conference that when we recognize sin in our lives and repent for it, we get healed of diseases and prevent diseases caused by that sin. So we can see how if we practice the biblical feasts and the spiritual principles they represent, how it was God's maintenance plan to keep us in divine health, because it helps us to keep short accounts spiritually, because through the symbolic reminders in the feasts, it helps us to keep our hearts clear from sin and to maintain our relationships with God ourselves and with others so that we don't open the doors for poisonous mindsets to take root and eventually develop into diseases. Practicing the seven biblical feasts and the spiritual principles that they represent keeps us in a lifestyle of applying Abba Father's kingdom principles for divine health. For example, the reminders to search our hearts for sin in Passover, like bitterness and unforgiveness, and applying the blood of Jesus by repenting of that in our hearts, and applying the bread of life, which is the word of God that teaches us to forgive, and restoring our relationships with others, as we are reminded to do in the Feast of Trumpets, will lead to healing in our lives of diseases like cancer and arthritis and so on that are caused by bitterness and unforgiveness. And eventually, 
as we learn to continue with the annual cycles of the biblical feasts, through applying the spiritual principles they represent in our lives as the feasts come around each year, then, for example, bitterness and unforgiveness doesn't stay in our hearts long enough to cause things like cancer and arthritis and so on, because the symbolic reminders in the biblical feasts keeps us in a place of checking our hearts for things like bitterness and unforgiveness and reminding us to forgive and so on. And so the lifestyle pattern that we are led into through the biblical feasts keeps us applying God's kingdom principles that leads to healing and health. And so as a result, it leads us to maintain the condition of our heart and soul so that eventually we don't get sick anymore, but just enjoy the good health, energy and abundant life that the feasts are designed to lead us into. Where we see this the best is in something that has been lost to Christians for generations, and it is this biblical concept called the counting of the Omer. An Omer was a unit of measurement that was used in biblical times. For example, they would measure barley and wheat in bunches called an Omer. The counting of the Omer is called the Feast of Weeks in Scripture. For example, Deuteronomy 16 verse 10 says, Then you shall celebrate the Feast of Weeks to the Lord your God with a tribute of a freewill offering of your hand, which you shall give just as the Lord your God blesses you. The Feast of Weeks is described or mentioned in many other scriptures, I've just given another three examples of scripture references on the screen. Leviticus 23 verse 15 explains how the Feast of Weeks is calculated. The Feast of Weeks consists of seven weeks, which is a total of 49 days. You start counting from the day of Passover, where Passover is day one. Then the Feast of Weeks continues for seven weeks or 49 days. Then the next day after day 49, which completes the Feast of Weeks, is day 50, which is Shavuot or the day of Pentecost. Remember, the Greek word pent means 50 because it is 50 days after Passover. During the seven weeks that make up the Feast of Weeks, an unbelievably significant spiritual principle is applied. After applying the spiritual principles of repentance in the first three feasts, the seven weeks of the Feast of Weeks is a time of renewing the mind. And the part that I personally find absolutely mind-blowing is the specific seven key areas that God leads his people to renew their minds in during this time. Can you guess what those seven areas are? This is the value of understanding how our spiritual journey in our relationship with Abba Father through Jesus parallels the story of Moses and the Israelites leaving Egypt and going on an exodus journey through the desert to their inheritance of the promised land. You can revise this in the first half an hour of session eight, part three, if you need to, where I shared how Abba Father desires for us to go on an exodus journey where we leave behind Egypt and all the sin and ways of the world it represents and go through a process of renewing our mind in the desert journey so that we can possess our promised land which is the abundant life that he has for us, where we live in his blessing in every dimension of our life and the way that he created us. Remember I explained in session eight, part 10, that before the Israelites could possess the promised land, they had to drive out seven enemy nations. And that when you translate the names of the seven enemy nations from Hebrew into English, they are the names 
of the seven main spiritual strongholds and poisonous mindsets that cause the different categories of diseases that we are facing today that we've been going through in the teaching sessions of this conference. And since the biblical feasts are God's maintenance plan to keep us in a lifestyle pattern of applying his kingdom principles that leads us into his abundant life, which includes keeping us in the blessing of divine health, it's no surprise to find out that these are the seven key areas of renewing the mind that the, that the Feast of Weeks focuses on. Because everything that the Israelites did in the Old Testament and the physical is a picture that God gave us that parallels the principles that he is leading us to apply spiritually. So, for example, in order to possess a portion of the promised land, the Israelites had to defeat and overcome the Hittites, which when translated into English means fear. So just as the Israelites had to face giants of fear in the physical in order to be able to possess a portion of their inheritance in the promised land, in the same way, in order for us to possess a portion of our inheritance, which is a life filled with love, peace and joy and all the health benefits that come from that, we need to learn to defeat and overcome the spiritual giant mentioned in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, which is the spirit of fear. Because as you've learned in detail in this conference so far, fear takes us into bondage spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, and physically. And fear leads to a whole category of diseases. And so in order to enjoy the fullness of our inheritance in Christ and the fullness of the blessing of divine health, and the fullness of our promised land, which is the abundant life that Abba Father has for us, we need to repent and renew our minds in the area of fear. So on the first day of the week, in the biblical feast of weeks, God's people search their hearts in the area of fear and ask the Holy Spirit to show us specific areas of fear that is in our life personally. And we repent for those specific fears the Holy Spirit shows us and spend time renewing our mind by reading and focusing on scriptures that equips us to overcome fear. So we do that in our quiet time with Abba Father, for example, early in the morning. But during the rest of the day, we also keep thinking about that specific area of focus for that day. For example, if it was fear over finances, in between what we are doing, as the Holy Spirit prompts and reminds us, we lift it up in prayer. For example, a prayer of thanksgiving and faith saying, Thank you, Abba Father, for cleansing my spirit, soul, body, memory trees in my brain and DNA of the fear of finances and all its curses and effects in my spirit, soul and body. Thank you, Abba Father, that you supply all my needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus, as you promised me in Philippians 4 verse 19. Thank you, Abba Father, that I do not have a spirit of fear, but of power, love and a sound mind, according to 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. And so the focus throughout that first day of the week, during the Feast of Weeks, is renewing our mind in the area of fear. In the series of videos of session nine of the online conference, I explain how the poisonous mindsets that come from a relationship breakdown with yourself, such as a low self-esteem, a low self-image, self-hatred, guilt, shame, condemnation, self-rejection, and a sense of unworthiness, causes various diseases and takes us into bondage in spirit, soul, and body. When you translate these mindsets into Hebrew, it is the enemy nation called the Canaanites that the Israelites had to learn to defeat and overcome. In the same way, we have to learn to defeat the same enemy nation and spiritual stronghold in our life. 
And this is the focus of the second day of the week in the Feast of Weeks, where we renew our mind with scriptures that helps us to build this healthy, strong, solid, godly self-esteem and identity that is based on the revelation of who we are in Christ. The focus on another day of the week during the Feast of Weeks is to focus on the area of bitterness and unforgiveness, praying and asking Holy Spirit to show us where this is relevant in our lives personally, and spending time reading and studying scriptures about the importance of forgiveness so that those scriptures are written on our hearts to remember. And in the process of renewing our mind in this area, it's going to close the door to the whole category of diseases we studied in session eight caused by bitterness and unforgiveness. Then the next day of the week, God's people focus on the next area so that by the end of the week, they have covered all seven areas. Then the next week, they repeat the whole process, going through one of the seven areas each day. And then this whole process is repeated seven times over seven weeks during the Feast of Weeks. And it's no surprise to find out that this is the most effective way of renewing the mind in terms of the way that the brain works and building new neural pathways in the brain. Because if you've stuck with me through all the sessions of the conference so far, you are learning how Abba Father designed our spirit, soul and body in patterns of seven as well. So when you live a lifestyle in his patterns, you're going to flow in the flow of the way that he designed you at the maximum potential at which he made you to function, including how the brain functions at its optimum in building neural pathways and memories that hold the information of the word of God that you have renewed your mind with. And it is also how long it takes on average for the body to heal. For example, when you have surgery, the doctors will tell you that it will take approximately just over six weeks for the tissue to heal. When you break a leg, it's put in plaster of Paris for the same amount of time. So we can see how this was Abba Father's genius lifestyle roadmap for us to maintain us in good health. This was his annual spiritual detox plan and renewing the mind and healing program that he gave us in the biblical feast of weeks. After completing this thorough clean out process of going through all that repentance and sanctification and washing of the water of the word for seven weeks, which is 49 days, the next day is day 50 the day of Pentecost or Shavuot, where we are refilled with a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit for the year ahead and can proceed forward with renewed spiritual authority. To keep your car in good condition, every 5,000 kilometers, you need to send your car in for a service for the oil filters and so on to be changed and that keeps the car in good condition. If we had been following God's patterns in scripture at his appointed times that he gave us in the biblical feasts, we would not be in counseling, having to deal with wounds and problems from things that happened years ago, for example, in our childhood. The spiritual principles represented in the seven biblical feasts and in the Feast of Weeks was God's way of getting his people to keep short accounts with him spiritually, where they take their heart in for a service every year and for a heart checkup, where, for example, at the Feast of Trumpets, they check their relationships and bring restoration where it's necessary through forgiveness. And then that doesn't give a chance for bitterness to take root. And so it keeps the person in good health. So there is massive health benefits in keeping the biblical feasts and understanding the spiritual principles they represent, which we need to incorporate into our lifestyle. There are not only spiritual principles encoded in the biblical feasts 
that leads us into divine health. But they are also linked to Abba Father's pattern of sevens concerning his kingdom principles for the management of our finances, which was given in scripture in detail, along with the instructions for the biblical feasts and are also practically applied in the biblical feasts. For example, during the Feast of First Fruits, they would bring the first fruits of their barley harvest, which is why the barley in the seven species of Israel is connected to the Feast of First Fruits. This was also called a wave offering because scripture instructed the priests to lift up and wave this first fruits offering before Abba Father, which was symbolic of Jesus being raised on the cross. And when he rose on the Feast of First Fruits, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20 explains that he became the first fruits of many, which is you and I today. And because of the first fruit offering that Jesus became, all of us are blessed. And in the same way, when we apply God's kingdom principle of giving what is called the Teruma first fruit offering of our finances to Abba Father, the rest of our finances will be blessed as a foreshadow again of what Jesus did on the cross. So the kingdom principles of finances represented in the biblical feasts is designed by Abba Father to lead us to prosper in the area of our finances into the fullness of his abundant blessing and provision for us. And I'm going to explain this in depth when we get to the session that is to do with overcoming fear in the area of our finances. One thing I have learned is that our financial income and God's provision for our lives does not depend on our hard work or on normal worldly streams of income like having a job or a monthly salary. That is an incorrect mindset that the enemy programmed into us so that we would submit to him in fear in the end times, feeling like we have no choice but to compromise with things such as, for example, pharmaceutical deceptions that are highly dangerous and damaging to our spirit, soul and body that people are being pressured into receiving with, for example, the threat of otherwise losing their jobs. But remember, God's provision for our lives does not depend on normal worldly streams of income, but on living according to his kingdom ways, which not only means managing our finances according to his biblical principles, but also walking in obedience to his word such as not going into fear and anxiety, but to stand strong in faith in trusting him. So please, please remember that in the times ahead and be encouraged not to buy into the enemy's lie as the pressure of these times increases, where eventually it won't be possible to work or to get normal worldly streams of income unless you make serious compromises with the enemy. In many places in scripture, including in the book of Revelations, Abba Father promises that he will look after his people who choose to trust him as they walk in uncompromising obedience to his word in relationship with him. Revelations 13 verse 17 prophesies of times that we are coming very close to in practical reality where God's people will not be able to buy or sell or take part in any economic transactions or businesses or go to the shops even to buy food without receiving the mark of the beast. But when it gets to that, just remember that Abba Father promised in Revelations 12 verse 14 that he would provide for us just like he supernaturally provided for the Israelites in the impossible conditions of the desert. The condition for a miracle from God is not difficulty, but impossibility. And because of the extreme circumstances of the times the world is heading into, 
we will eventually experience miracles on a daily basis of Abba Father's supernatural protection and provision as long as we stand strong and don't compromise and keep our eyes fixed on him so that we don't fall into fear. So it's very important to remember that when the pressure comes that you may lose your job and so on. Abba Father has made a way for his people ahead of time outside the worldly system. So to repeat that important statement so that you don't forget it in the times ahead, remember Abba Father's provision does not depend on normal worldly streams of income, but on living according to his kingdom ways. So the session on finances is going to be very important and relevant to these times. The biblical feasts are not only designed to lead us into a lifestyle pattern of applying Abba Father's kingdom principles, which leads us into abundant life in the area of our health and finances, but in absolutely every dimension of our lives. But the most important purpose of keeping the biblical feasts and the spiritual principles that they represent is that it was designed by Abba Father to equip us to sanctify, purify and prepare ourselves so that we will be found ready when Jesus comes to fetch his bride for the marriage supper of the Lamb. You see, not all born again Christians will be taken up in the rapture because sadly, not all born again Christians will be ready. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 45 explains that just as there was a first Adam in the Garden of Eden, Jesus is the last Adam. And just as the first Eve was Adam's wife, so the bride of Christ is the last Eve. And just as Eve came from Adam's rib, so the bride will come out of the body of Christ or the church. In other words, in the end times in which we find ourselves, the Christian church and the bride of Christ is not necessarily the same thing. In fact, eventually the church will be converted in the end times into a counterfeit bride, which is the harlot bride of lukewarmness, compromise, sin and fleshliness described in Revelations chapter 18. And that is why in verse 4 of Revelations 18, where the harlot bride is described, Abba Father said, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, and so you will not receive any of her plagues. This is important to understand, because many Christians have been taught a false security, where just because they've prayed the prayer of salvation, and become born again children of God, they don't have to be concerned about or pay any attention to anything related to the end times because it's not relevant to them because the church will be raptured before any of it takes place. In the meantime, they, continue, they can continue living as they please in a fleshly lifestyle of compromise, no different from the rest of the world. But remember, Jesus warned in Revelations 3 verse 16, so because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Christians that are not ready on the Feast of Trumpets, on the year that this feast is fulfilled, where Jesus comes to fetch his bride for the marriage supper of the Lamb, will be left behind to go through the full extent of the great tribulation described in the book of Revelations as a final act of God's mercy, because it will be a time where the circumstances are so extreme that you can't stay lukewarm. Either you will repent and your heart will become hot for God as you walk through the refiner's fire of the tribulation, or your heart will grow cold as you become a part of the great falling away that scripture prophesied about. The book of Revelation says, that Christians in the Great Tribulation 
will eventually have to give their life, where they will be beheaded by guillotine if they refuse the mark of the beast. But scripture promises that they will also receive eternal life and will be a part of what the Feast of Tabernacles represents, where they will reign with Jesus and his bride in the final 1,000 years on earth. But it is better to allow Abba Father to judge us now and to repent now than to go through the full extent of the Great Tribulation to get to that place of sanctification. Scripture says that the Great Tribulation will be a time more terrible than any other time ever recorded in history. It will make Hitler and his concentration camps look like child's play in comparison. Matthew 24 verse 21 says, For at that time there will be a great tribulation, pressure, distress and oppression, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor will ever be again. That is why Jesus said in Luke 21 verse 36, watch. That means stay spiritually awake and pray that you will be counted worthy to escape the things to come. It's important to understand all of these things, not to bring fear, because remember, fear is not of Abba Father. It is a warning to tell us to get ready. Remember, the purpose of the sound of the shofar in the Feast of Trumpets is to wake up the sleeping bride in spiritual slumber to get ready and prepared because the King is coming. And once again, the main purpose of the lifestyle of repentance and sanctification that the biblical feasts leads us into is that it gets us to the place of being ready when Jesus comes to fetch his bride. For the end time bride of Christ, the biblical feasts are very, 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 very important. In scripture, the feasts are also called God's appointed times. The feasts help us to understand God's appointed times and the prophetic significance of Jesus's first coming, and more importantly in this time, they help us to understand the end time events surrounding his second coming. The feasts help us to understand what it means to be ready for his return and to know the season of when to expect him. The biblical feasts were first mentioned in Genesis 1 verse 14, which says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Another translation says, And God said, Let there be lights in the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. You see, the sun and moon and stars in the sky is God's billboard. It's his notice board to his people to tell them when to pay attention because something prophetically significant is going to happen. The Hebrew word used here for signs to mark the seasons or sacred times is Moedim. And that is the biblical feasts, which are God's sacred appointed times, because the Hebrew word for biblical feasts is also Moedim, and directly translated into English means prophetic rehearsals. The biblical feasts are prophetic rehearsals for the end time bride. I've explained to you how the biblical feasts are prophetic of Jesus' first and second coming, and how the feasts at the beginning of the year are prophetic of Jesus' first coming and all that he did when he was crucified. Did you ever wonder like me 
about Matthew 21 verse 9, which describes the time when Jesus was riding into Jerusalem on a donkey just before the feast and the time he was crucified. And masses of people were alongside the road with palm tree leaves singing, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. If you think about it practically, how did all the crowds of people know to do that? This specific event was prophesied in scripture. How did all those crowds of people know that this would be the day that this prophecy in scripture would be fulfilled? How did all those crowds of people know that Jesus was coming at that time on that day to Jerusalem? Because only Jesus and his disciples would know their personal plans. And it's not like they had WhatsApp and social media to spread the news or to organize an event like that at that specific time. And it's not like somebody went through Jerusalem spreading the word to say, hey guys, Jesus is coming. I have a random idea. Let's all get palm tree leaves and welcome him into Jerusalem. The crowds of people were all there doing that at that specific time because that is what they would do as a part of the prophetic rehearsals of the biblical feasts. And therefore, listen carefully. They were doing the right thing at the right place at the right time as many prophecies in scripture were fulfilled right in front of them on that day. Every year, the people would be there with palm trees declaring scripture that was relevant to the meaning of that event, which they had been taught to do as a part of the feasts at this time. And during this event, the priest would walk down the road with a perfect spotless lamb which would later be sacrificed at Passover. But this particular year, as they were doing this, the fulfillment of these prophetic rehearsals took place as the perfect spotless Lamb of God himself came riding through. And one of the reasons the Pharisees plotted to have Jesus crucified is because he stole their thunder on that day. Just like the prophetic rehearsals of the feasts at the beginning of the year put God's people in a place of doing the right thing at the right time when they were fulfilled at Jesus' first coming. So the feasts at the end of the year are going to put God's people in the end times in a place of doing the right thing at the right time. Because the biblical feasts leads us into a lifestyle pattern where we also prophetically rehearse for Jesus' second coming so that we will be ready at the right time. The biblical feasts or Moedim are prophetic rehearsals that are designed to help us understand prophetically significant times and seasons. Scripture says, that when Jesus comes to fetch his bride in the rapture, it's going to be like a thief in the night. It will catch the world by total surprise as many people suddenly disappear from this planet. But it won't be completely unexpected like a thief in the night for the bride because the biblical feasts not only lead us into a lifestyle that prepares us to be ready as the bride, but the feasts were designed by Abba Father to also help us to understand the season of when to expect Jesus coming for his bride. Because we know he's coming on the Feast of Trumpets, and it helps us to understand the end time events which are prophetically symbolized in the feasts. So unlike the world, the bride won't be caught completely by surprise. For her, Jesus' coming won't be like a thief in the night because she is awake, watching, waiting, and is ready. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 2 to 6 says, Now as to times and dates, brothers and sisters, you have no need for anything to be written to you. 
What Paul was saying there is that the Hebrew people he was speaking to at that time understood and practiced the biblical feasts, so there was no need for him to explain the biblical feasts to them, which are the Moedim given to help us understand the signs of the times, as Genesis 1 verse 14 said. But carrying on with reading 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 2, Paul continues to say, For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. So then let us not sleep in spiritual indifference as the rest of the world does, but let us keep wide awake, alert and cautious, and let us be sober. This is a time in history where, as I speak right now, two very significant things are happening in the spiritual realm. We are seeing the beginnings of what 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 1 prophesied about a great falling away as many people fall into the deception of the end times and their hearts grow cold as they spiritually drift away from a relationship with Abba Father and his kingdom ways. And through their fleshly worldly lifestyle, they fall into spiritual slumber. At the same time, the sleeping bride is waking up to hear the sound of the trumpet call. Many are awakening to the warning sound of the alarm. The awakening blast of the shofar calling the bride to awaken from spiritual slumber because the signs are there that the bridegroom is coming and the biblical feasts are leading the bride of Christ to be in step with the rhythm of Abba Father's heartbeat and timing so that she is sanctified, purified and found ready, prepared, awake, watching and waiting when he comes. And that is why the seven biblical feasts are so important. The prophetic significance of the biblical feasts is nicely summarized by this painting, which you can get at the website shown on the screen. Here you can see in picture form what each of the seven biblical feasts represent. So it's a nice tool to explain the biblical feast to somebody and give them a quick overview in two to five minutes. For example, the painting shows how Passover represents the time when the Israelites were delivered from Egypt and when we were delivered from the devil and sin, which is what Egypt represents spiritually through the blood of the lamb when Jesus was crucified. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is when Jesus was buried for three days. The Feast of First Fruits represents when Jesus rose from the dead to become the first fruits of many, which was you and I to come. Pentecost or Shavuot represents receiving the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. The Feast of Trumpets is when Jesus comes to fetch his bride at what is known as the Rapture. The Day of Atonement is when God's judgment will hit the earth in the time of the Great Tribulation and later when the books are closed for judgment, when Jesus returns with his worshipping warrior bride and his army to defeat the Antichrist and remove Satan and sin from the world. And the Feast of Tabernacles is where we will rule and reign with Jesus, who will live and tabernacle amongst us in the new millennium. So as you can see, these biblical feasts are the testimony of Jesus, hidden from past generations, but now revealed. This is another painting by the same artist, which shows how the menorah and the seven biblical feasts coincides with the other patterns of seven, 
such as the seven colours of the rainbow and the sevenfold Holy Spirit. Now remember that just as God has designed creation and the human body and everything in his kingdom in patterns of sevens, Satan has also designed his kingdom in a counterfeit pattern of sevens to specifically oppose each of the pattern of sevens in God's kingdom. And just as God has seven biblical feasts that lead his people into his kingdom ways, which leads us to becoming his bride, so the world has seven counterfeit feasts that are rooted in occultic ways of Babylon and Egypt, which is Satan's kingdom of darkness. And these feasts of the world are Christmas, Easter, New Year, Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, Father's Day, and Halloween. These feasts have nothing to do with Jesus. Everything done in these feasts has spiritual significance to Tammuz, who is the Antichrist of the Book of Revelations. From about 306 AD, the Roman Emperor Constantine was in power. And during his reign, he introduced these worldly feasts into the body of Christ and removed the biblical feasts. He also changed the Sabbath day of rest, and he hid God's principles of financial management in the way the Bible was translated, and he removed many other important biblical keys that have been lost to Christians for many generations, and he replaced them with pagan feasts and traditions in an effort to unite the pagans and the Christians, and we are still affected by this to this day. Where many Christians, including myself in the past, celebrated these worldly feasts through lack of knowledge. But now that we are aware of this, it is an important area for repentance and sanctification in our lives. Because in session 12 of the conference, I'm going to explain how participation in the occult opens the door to many physical diseases and psychiatric illnesses and it becomes a block to healing. The Roman Emperor Constantine, who introduced these pagan feasts into the church and the church leadership that came through all the generations following that were Freemasons, which is the modern version still present today of the ancient pagan religion of Egypt that worshipped Satan. These feasts were celebrated long before Jesus' birth, as far back as the biblical times in the Old Testament, because as I mentioned, they have nothing to do with Jesus, and the Bible actually warns us not to take part in them. For example, when it comes to Christmas, and the typical traditions of Christmas like the Christmas tree, in Jeremiah 10 verse 1 to 4, God said that we must not learn the ways of the heathen pagan nations. And it specifically says not to go and cut a tree and put it in your house and decorate it, which is part of the traditions of this pagan feast, because the Christmas tree is another version of the obelisk which is an occultic symbol of Baal that was part of the ancient pagan religion of Egypt and the modern version of it, which is Freemasonry today. And you will still find this obelisk symbol in the buildings of church denominations that are headed by leadership that are Freemasons. Their purpose is to introduce the spirit of death into the church and into the body of Christ so that it becomes nothing more than dead religion with mixed seed. In other words, mixed with the seed of the serpent through the subtle introduction of the worldly ways of Egypt, as the Freemason translators have also progressively changed the word of God so that it is no longer in its original form. If you look at the NIV version of the Bible, for example, 50% of it has been changed. For example, if you compare the book of Isaiah, 
to the original Hebrew manuscripts, 50% of it in the NIV has been changed. I once met a Hebrew scholar of the Bible who explained to me how there are 66 different stages and translations of the Bible, progressively changing the Bible and diluting scripture until they get to the 66th stage, which will be a Bible that says that Jesus was a false prophet and the Antichrist is the real Messiah and Son of God. The NIV, which is 50% changed, was stage number 33 of 66, in other words, halfway. The Message Bible, for example, is number 47 out of 66. And if you look at the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6 of the Message Bible, just to mention one example, a lot of the Lord's Prayer has been replaced with phrases from Freemasonry and the occult. For example, the words, as above, so below. The most accurate translation that we have in English is the Old King James. But when we bring occultic idols and symbols into our home, like a Christmas tree, which is a Freemason obelisk, scriptures such as, for example, Deuteronomy 7 verse 26, explains that it opens the door to a curse and for the kingdom of darkness to operate in our lives. That is why when God's people in the Bible turn back to him in repentance after sanctifying their hearts, the very next thing that Abba Father told them to do was to cleanse their houses of occultic idols and symbols. For example, in the story of Gideon, you see him smashing the Asherah, which was another scriptural term for the obelisk of ancient Egypt and modern Freemasonry today, which the Christmas tree is another version of. Abba Father is a jealous God who doesn't want to share us with the kingdom of darkness because participating in the ways of the kingdom of darkness always leads us into bondage spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, and physically. And that is why, in reference to the worldly feasts that come from Egypt, God said, I hate your feasts. In Amos 5 verse 21, God spoke about the feasts of the world that are still celebrated today, where he said, I hate, I despise and reject your feasts, and I do not take delight in your solemn assemblies. There's no time to explain these occultic feasts of the world in further depth here, but an excellent teaching resource that I can refer you to on this is a teaching by Tian Hildenhais, which is freely available on YouTube called The Christmas Lie, which explains the real meaning behind the traditions of these feasts and how they are related to the occultic ways of Egypt and Babylon. I have known Tian personally for several years and can testify that he genuinely has a close, intimate love relationship with Abba Father and that this is a safe source of teaching that is uncompromised and undiluted and in line with the truth of God's word. Earlier, I explained how you see the fingerprint of God's feasts, even in the creation of the human body and in agriculture. And you even see it in the animals and in the birds. For example, an interesting phenomenon that you can witness in Israel is the migration of massive flocks of birds from Europe to Africa where they pass over Israel during the time of the feasts at the beginning of the year. And then they fly back passing over Israel again during the time of the feasts at the end of the year. And in reference to this, God said in Jeremiah 8 verse 7, even the birds know how to keep my appointed times, which is the biblical feasts. But he said, my people do not know 
how to keep my feasts. The biblical feasts have been lost to God's people for generations, but he is re-revealing them to us now through his scriptures for such a time as this. Through the lifestyle of repentance and sanctification that God's biblical feasts lead us into, Abba Father is calling his people to go on an exodus journey to leave all the ways of Egypt in every area of our lives behind so that we can enter the ark of his protection in these end times. The awakening call of the trumpet is sounding. Can you hear it?
Thank you, Abba Father. Thank you that we can release a sound. Thank you, Lord, that every feast is a dress rehearsal for your coming, for the feast that needs to come into fulfillment. Thank you, Father, that we can keep ourselves ready when your Son returns. Thank you, Father, that each one of us has a sound to release. Thank you, Father, that we can release a sound so that the people can awaken, that your bride can awaken. Thank you, Father, for open heaven. Thank you for your angels ministering to us. Thank you for your warrior angels. Thank you for the angels that brings messages to us, like in Daniel. Thank you that we can come and drink from your living waters. It's for free. Amen.
Now, when it comes to the seven biblical feasts and all the wonderful revelation that comes from understanding the Bible in its original Hebrew context, I would like to give a word of caution about the importance of receiving this revelation in balance so that you don't make the mistake of going from one extreme to the other and just exchanging one form of religion for the other. There are some people who have taken this way out of balance, where the focus has become all about the rituals and the things that you do outwardly in the feast, of, for example, what exactly to have on the table in a Passover meal, and that, for example, we cannot pray unless we have a prayer shawl over our head. And there are groups of people who have become more Jewish than the Jews. What is important is the spiritual principles that these things represent and living them in our daily lives. That is what will unlock God's blessing and lead us into the abundant life that Jesus died to give us. There was a revival that took place which was originally from the heart of God, wanting to restore to his people vital biblical keys that have been lost through many generations. But in many groups of people, this revival was hijacked by a spirit of religion and a horrible spirit of self-righteousness and a critical judgmental spirit where some of these people started to look down on other Christians who had not yet come into the knowledge and understanding of these things and they took on a sense of superiority because in their minds they had more truth than them and the spirit of division came in and major church splits took place and it absolutely fractured the body of Christ and I have personally had experiences of, for example, standing by the hospital beds of pastors who were sick with life-threatening illnesses caused by an absolutely devastated and broken heart from the experience of having a group of people that they had spent years teaching and discipling and laying down their lives for, torn apart by what became known as the Hebrew Roots Movement. And the fruit of all of this division and devastation is not the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So it put many Christians off and closed their hearts to these important biblical truths. Whenever we share the truth of God's word with somebody, it must be in total humility with gentleness and love. And when we apply the spiritual principles of the biblical feasts, we must do it because we want to. Coming from a genuine heart motive of love for Abba Father and for Jesus as our bridegroom, because we want to be his bride and we are lovesick for him. Not because we feel we have to out of fear, because we're afraid of being left behind, for example. That's not the kind of relationship that Jesus, our bridegroom, desires to have with us that is based on the false bond of fear, because then it is just law that doesn't bring life, it brings bondage. And remember, I explained in session two, part one, that works based on fear are dead works that carry no weight in the spiritual realm and eternity. I would like to read out page 306 from the Shema book, written by Sarah from Bridal Harvest, on this important point that I've just shared. Leviticus 23 verse 1 to 4 says, The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The set feasts or appointed seasons of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as holy convocations, even my set feasts, are these. Now once again notice in the scripture that God said these are my feasts. The biblical feasts are not a man-made idea and they are not just for the Jews, they are God's feasts for his people. Six days shall work be done, 
But the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, a holy convocation or assembly by summons. You shall do no work on that day. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. These are the set feasts or appointed seasons of the Lord, holy convocations that you shall proclaim at these stated times. My appointed times are a part of my kingdom, or they are the promise fulfilled of what I have done, and they are the promise of what is to come. As for you, you can either abide in it or not, but I tell you, my covenant people will abide in my feasts. You do not keep my feasts according to my spirit when you outwardly do all the feasts or Shabbat, for this is abiding in the old covenant. When you keep my feasts, you should firstly abide in my priesthood and then in my kingdom, otherwise it results in empty works and you abide in the old way. And I just want to say here that remember I explained in previous sessions that the priesthood means renewing our mind with the word of God so that our hearts and inner life is transformed as we spend time with our Father in his presence. The kingdom is where we apply God's word to our outer life. So to read it again, you do not keep my feasts according to my spirit when you outwardly do all the feasts or Shabbat, for this is abiding in the old covenant. When you keep my feasts, you should firstly abide in my priesthood and then in my kingdom, otherwise it results in empty works and you abide in the old way. You should abide in the spirit of my feasts as you live what the feast is all about. For example, the feast of unleavened bread. You don't keep the feast according to my spirit by not eating anything leavened and removing all the leaven from your home. You keep my feast of unleavened bread as a spiritual principle through removing the pride, which is the leaven, out of your heart and out of your life. That is the fulfillment of the feast in you. And remember, I explained previously that pride is where we live for ourselves. It's a worldly lifestyle of living for the temporary pleasures of the flesh. So the spiritual principle of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is to die to self and crucify the flesh, as I explained in depth previously. Now the symbolic manner of not eating leaven is not required and it will not justify you. However, when you do abide in the spiritual principle of the feast, you may keep the symbolic value of the first as my spirit leads you. In other words, you can choose not to eat any leavened bread during the feast of unleavened bread or any of the other things that are outwardly done in the biblical feasts as a physical prophetic act of the commitment that you are making in your heart to repent or to die to self or to crucify the flesh. But you understand that living according to the spiritual principle it represents is more important than doing the outward things. So to carry on reading, for your dedication toward what I desire is pleasing to me. Not eating the leavened bread and removing it from your house will put a seal upon your desire to live a walk free from self and sin. The symbolic value of my feasts are pleasing to me, and therefore it is like a seal, but it is not my heart for my feasts, it is only the shadow. Therefore I am the I am, and I want to lead my people by my spirit into living the life that the feasts are a shadow of. For I tell you a secret, those who have heard but do not keep my feasts in any way do not have the lifestyle that my feasts are a shadow of. My feasts are important to me, and those who walk by my spirit will have understanding about why it's important to me. I want to invite you to come and feast at my table 
on my appointed times. For my feasts are a table of blessing, and all who come and sit at my table will receive blessing. I saw a very big table in the spirit. It was massive and it was divided into seven sections. And in each section, there were different things on the table. There was also a really big menorah that stretched over the whole table and the seven branches were spread over the seven sections. Yeshua, which remember is Jesus' name in Hebrew, sat at the head of the table and he was handing out different things in different times. It was very joyous and there was music playing and the people worshipped and everybody feasted. There were children, families, and there were also people at the table who were alone because their families did not come to love the feasts of Yahweh. But they abided in the spirit of Shabbat with their eyes on Messiah. I also saw the word of I am was, on, was open on the table, and he blew over his book, and the words came alive, and started dancing on the table. I asked Yeshua, what are they? And he answered while smiling, now they are a blessing unto those who come to my feasts. Let this not be orthodox for you, but walk according to my spirit, and you will abide in my feasts. And appointed times. That last section in Sarah's vision meant that the Word of God comes alive with rich revelation for us when we keep God's appointed times of the biblical feasts and live according to the spiritual principles they represent. For many generations, God's people in terms of Christians have been like a tree with branches but with little or no roots. Where we've had the understanding of Jesus as the Son of God and God's grace and the Holy Spirit, but because we have lost important biblical roots, such as the understanding of the biblical feasts and so on, it was like a tree with very little roots and thus could not be fully fruitful as Abba Father designed us to be. And then the Jewish people in Israel have been like a tree with well-developed roots, but with no branches. In other words, the Jewish people never lost our biblical roots. In them, these biblical roots are very well developed in the sense that they have had the rich heritage where through all their generations, they have been practicing the biblical feasts and so on. But they have not had the full understanding of what these things mean because the feasts are all about Jesus, our Messiah, Bridegroom, and King. And because they do not yet have the revelation that he is the Son of God and the Messiah, they have just been applying it like a religious ritual with little understanding. So instead of having branches, which is the understanding of Jesus as the Son of God and how he is revealed through these feasts and grace and the Holy Spirit, they have just had a religious system instead of proper branches. And so this tree couldn't be fruitful either. And just like the hearts of the Christians were closed to the truth of the importance of their biblical roots, such as the biblical feasts, because of the wrong spirit in which this truth was often shared, so the hearts of the Jewish people have been closed to the truth and revelation of Jesus as the Messiah and it's sad to realize this, but you can ask any Jew and they will tell you this, that what put them off the most to receiving the truth of Jesus as the Messiah and Son of God is the Christians. They look at the lawless lifestyle of the majority of Christians and Jewish people say, their Jesus can't be the Messiah because scripture says that the Messiah is a king of righteousness. And they look at all the occultism in the church, for example, the Christmas trees and Easter eggs. And more importantly, they see the fleshly, worldly, lukewarm lifestyle of us Christians, and it just absolutely repulsed them. So in the past, Christians would go to Israel and try to evangelize to the Jews by telling them about Jesus, and it just angered them. 
what the Jewish people in Israel say concerning the Christians is we are not interested in what you have to say. We want to see how you live. Remember I explained in session seven, part two, that the menorah in the tabernacle, which is a lampstand with seven candles, is us. True evangelism is not telling people about Jesus. It's about showing them who he is through the life that we live. Matthew 7 verse 16 says that you shall know them by their fruit. John 13 verse 35 says you shall know them by their love. But listen to this because this is absolutely mind-blowing awesome. Abba Father knew all along from before the foundation of the world and beginning of time that it would be like this. Because scripture says that God purposefully put a veil over the eyes of the Jewish people so that they could not see the fullness of the truth to give us, the Gentile Christians, the chance to come into his kingdom. This was prophetically symbolized in Exodus 34 verse 33 when Moses put a veil over his face to conceal the glory of God shining on his face from the Israelites. Isaiah 44 verse 18 says, They know not, nor do they discern, for he has shut their eyes so that they cannot see, and their hearts so that they cannot understand. But 2 Corinthians 3 verse 12 to 13 says, Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end, but their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed, and we behold, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. Scripture speaks about the veil being lifted from the eyes of God's people. First the Christians, and then after that, in the end times, the veil will be lifted from the Jews, so that they can see their bridegroom, and gain the full understanding and revelation of who he is as the Messiah and Son of God. This was prophetically symbolized in Matthew 27 verse 51, when Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for his bride, and the veil in the temple was torn open. The book of Daniel has many prophecies about the end times, that tie in exactly with what is prophesied in the book of Revelations. And Daniel 12 verse 4 says, But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. This scripture is referring to the veil that Abba Father put over scripture, which would be removed in the end times when his people would gain the fullness of understanding of the revelation from scripture about the bridegroom. As I mentioned, the veil was lifted first for the Christians, referred to in our Bibles as the Gentiles, to give us a chance to come into his kingdom. For example, Romans 11 verse 25 says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. But in the end times, Abba Father is going to remove the veil from the eyes of the Jewish people so that they can see the face of their bridegroom and they will gain a revelation of who he is as the Messiah and Son of God. John 19 verse 37 says, 
And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. That other scripture in John 19 verse 37 was referring to Zechariah 12 verse 10, which says, Then I will pour out on the house of David and on the people of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and prayer, and they will look on me, the one they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only, only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. When the Jewish people realize that Jesus, Yeshua, is the Messiah, there will be a time of great mourning in Israel because they missed it all this time. But then after a time of tears of grief, there's going to be great rejoicing. Now, this is the part that is mind-blowing awesome. What is the key that God had all along that is going to unlock the revelation to the Jewish people of Jesus as the Messiah and Son of God? The answer is the biblical feasts. The biblical feast is the key that God had all along from the beginning of time that is going to remove the veil so that the Jewish people can see their bridegroom and gain a revelation of Yeshua as the Messiah and Son of God. Because when the veil is lifted to see him who they pierced, they are suddenly going to, for example, see the matzah in the feast of Passover and unleavened bread. And they are going to recognize the holes representing Yeshua being pierced on the cross. They're going to recognize the burnt patches as the bruises Yeshua received to pay the price for our sin and iniquities, as it says in Isaiah 53 verse 5. And they're going to see the stripes on the matzah representing the stripes that Yeshua received to pay the price for our healing. And suddenly, as the veil is lifted, the Jewish people are going to see Jesus, Yeshua the Messiah, in all the things that they had been doing in the biblical feasts all along for all their generations up until now. The biblical feasts is God's key which he designed from the beginning to bring his people, who are the Christians and the Jews, back together in the end times to make his complete bride. In scripture, Israel, which is God's people, consists of 12 tribes. The Jewish people of modern Israel consists of only the generational line of two tribes, which is the tribe of Benjamin and Judah. This is the house of Judah, which is where the name Jew comes from. There's no time to explain this in depth here, but long story short, the other 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel were lost and scattered through the Gentile nations, and that is where the Christians come from. This is the house of Ephraim and Joseph. This was also prophetically alluded to in the parable Jesus spoke of in Luke 15, verse 11 to 32, which is often called the parable of the lost son. The Jews are the brother that stayed in the house. They kept their heritage and inheritance, for example, of the biblical feasts. The lost son is the Christian's who strayed into the ways of the world and lost their rich heritage of their biblical roots, such as the biblical feasts, etc. But in the end times, the two brothers are going to come together and be restored to make the full house. The book of Ezekiel called this the two sticks and prophesied that in the end times, the two sticks would come back together as one to complete the full house of the whole family of God's people and to complete his bride. Ezekiel 37 verse 15 to 17 says, The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, 
Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah, for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions, and join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. The Jewish people today have the way. In other words, they are following God's biblical principles, which is his kingdom ways. And the Christians have had the truth and the life, which is the revelation of Jesus as the Messiah and Son of God, who is the truth. And they've had the life, which is the revelation of grace and the Holy Spirit, because scriptures such as John 6 verse 63 says that the Spirit brings life. But now what is starting to happen is that the two trees or the two sticks are coming together. Where the Christians are starting to wake up and recognize the occultism that has crept into the church, such as the pagan roots of the world's feasts and are getting rid of it in their lives. And they are coming back into a revelation of the importance of the biblical feasts and other biblical roots that have been lost to Christianity for generations, and they are being restored to Abba Father's kingdom ways, not only in the biblical feasts, but in their lifestyle as a whole, as they are led into the lifestyle of repentance and sanctification that the spiritual principles in the feasts lead us into. And at the same time, there's an awakening amongst the Jewish people who are coming to a revelation of Jesus or Yeshua as the Messiah and Son of God. So now the roots and the branches are coming back together and now finally you have a tree that can be fruitful. Now you have the way, the truth and the life, which is the full package and the complete bride. It has personally taken me a very long time to fully understand what Jesus meant in John 4 verse 24 when he said that there will come a time where my people worship me in spirit and in truth. This means walking in the way, the truth and the life. He was talking about the time that would come when his bride would live a lifestyle of worship which is a lifestyle of Shema, listening to and obeying his word, where we walk in his kingdom ways, but not from the place of law, where we do it out of fear or because we feel we have to or are scared what will happen if we don't, because the law on its own is just the empty dead works of religion and the dead works of the flesh. But it is walking in his ways because we want to as an overflow of our love for him, who is the truth, as a work of the Holy Spirit, who is the life. This is when God's ways bring life, victory and freedom. So the biblical feasts is a major key to bringing together the Jewish people who have kept Abba Father's kingdom ways together with the Christians who've had the revelation and understanding of the truth and the life, which is the Son and Holy Spirit. And now you have the complete bride walking in the image of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the way, the truth, and the life. The Jews and Christians coming together to complete the bride which is the roots and branches coming together to form a fruitful tree is an extremely prophetically significant in time event because it's going to do nothing less than usher in the coming of the Messiah. I pray that in this moment, Abba Father would baptize you with the Holy Spirit of understanding so that you can see the incredible 
weighty significance of this. When you see the Christians and the people of Israel coming together, where the Christians are returning to their biblical roots, and the Jewish people see the revelation of Yeshua as the Messiah through the biblical feasts and so on, watch the space because the king is on his way. Jesus explained this in Matthew chapter 24, where in the whole chapter, he was talking about end time events. And in this context, he said in verse 32 and 33, now learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you will know that he is near right at the door. This scripture is also prophetically referring to the rebirth of the nation of Israel on the geographical map in 1948, which was also a prophetically significant event. But remember that the word of God has seven layers of meaning and in a deeper layer, it's referring to the blossoming bride. This is why in the seven species of Israel, figs are linked to the Feast of Trumpets. The fig tree beginning to bud is the blossoming bride signaling that Yeshua's coming to fetch his bride is right at the door. The Jews and Christians coming together to complete the bride, which is the roots and branches coming together to form a fruitful tree, is the blossoming lampstand that is prophetically referred to in many scriptures in the Bible. In Matthew 24 verse 37, Jesus said that in the end times when he comes back, it will be as in the days of Noah, because there are many prophetic pictures in the story of Noah and spiritual parallels to the end times. The dove bringing Noah a freshly picked olive leaf was a prophetic picture of the promise to the bridegroom Yeshua of the lampstand that would begin to blossom in the end times, which is a fruitful bride. In session seven, part two, I explained that scripture describes the bride as an olive tree. For example, Psalm 52 verse eight says, but I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. In Jeremiah 11 verse 16, it says, the Lord called your name a green olive tree, beautiful in fruit and form. There are many, many other scriptures that call the bride an olive tree. Some other scripture references, just as a few examples, are shown on the screen. There are also two olive trees described in scripture. The original olive tree, which is the brother who stayed in the house, keeping his rich heritage, which is the Jewish people, and then the lost son or the lost 10 tribes who are the Christians, who is called the wild olive tree in scripture, who returned to the house and was adopted back as a son, or as this scripture says, was grafted in. In Romans 11 verse 17, it says, but if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive were grafted in among them and became a partaker with them, of the rich root of the olive tree. The two olive trees representing the Jewish people and the Christians, which make up the complete bride, was given in a prophetic picture to the prophet Zechariah. Zechariah 4 verse 3 says, And I see two olive trees, one on each side of the bowl. From the previous scriptures I've just shown you, we already know that these two olive trees are the two parts of Yahweh's bride, the Jewish people of Israel today and the Christians from the Gentile nations. But in verses 12 to 14 of Zechariah chapter 4, God gives the answer to what the two olive trees represent. It says, And a second time I answered and said to him, What are these two branches of the olive trees? 
And he said to me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he said to me, they represent the two anointed ones who stand in the courts of the Lord of all the earth. These exact words are repeated in the book of Revelations. So hopefully this is going to crack open the meaning of another verse in the book of Revelations for you. Because as I said, we are going to trust Abba Father to crack open the meaning of the book of Revelations for us in this season, one verse at a time. Because we are in the end times where the veil is being lifted for us to gain the full revelation and understanding as well. Zechariah 4 verse 14 said that the two olive trees represent the two anointed ones who stand in the court of the Lord of all the earth. Here are the exact same words in Revelations 11 verse 4. These two prophets are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of all the earth. Now remember that that word lampstand in scripture is referring to the menorah of the tabernacle. In session seven, part two, I explained in detail how the golden menorah in the tabernacle is the bride walking in the image of God and demonstrating who he is through her life to those around her. And in this way is a light to the nations, which is what the shining candles burning from the olive oil on the menorah represents. Remember that lovely song we were taught as children in Bible school, which goes like this. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine, etc., etc. In Matthew 5, verse 15 to 16, Jesus said, Likewise, when people light a lamp, they don't cover it with a bowl. In other translations, it says bushel, but put it on a lampstand so that it shines for everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. The bride being a light is her being a witness to the nations of who God is. In other words, the two olive trees and the two lampstands are also the two witnesses of the book of Revelations. This is the Christians and the Jewish people in the end times who have come together as the bride of Yahweh through the biblical feasts and the process of repentance and sanctification that they represent. The prophet Elijah walked in great spiritual authority, power and anointing, so much so that he was able to even shut up the heavens and prevent it raining for three and a half years, which is a time frame that is significant to end time events. Malachi 4 verse 5 says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. The story of Elijah is a foreshadow of the end times when the spirit of Elijah would be poured out on the bride of Yahweh, who will operate in the same level of tremendous spiritual authority, power, and anointing because of the process of repentance and sanctification that she has been through that is represented in the biblical feasts and being filled with the Holy Spirit after the cleansing process as represented in Shavuot or the Feast of Pentecost. 
Revelations 11 verse 3 to 6 says, And I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. They are the two olive trees and the two lampstands, and they stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. They have power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time that they are prophesying. The two witnesses prophesying for 1,260 days is three and a half years, which is a connection to the story of Elijah. And just as Elijah shut up the heavens so that it did not rain for three and a half years, so the bride of Yahweh will be able to do the same because of the tremendous spiritual authority she is operating in. And the fire coming out of her mouth is the word of God that defeats the enemy. But once again, this great outpouring of spiritual anointing on the bride comes as a result of the repentance and sanctification process that she has been through. This is represented by the sackcloth in the scripture, which is mentioned in over 50 other scriptures as a sign of repentance and fasting. I've just included a few scripture references here as an example from the book of Jonah, Esther, Daniel, Isaiah, and two kings. I also took the time to point out the two witnesses of revelations in the scripture to you, to point out to you that the bride will be here for the birth pangs and part of the end time world events, where it's very difficult times in the world, because it is in the refiner's fire that we are refined, sanctified, and purified. Abba Father will remove his people before the tribulation gets really horrific, but he will let us experience some of the fire of the end times, because the fire of these difficult times is what is going to get the bride to the place of being ready and prepared for the coming of the bridegroom, where her heart is hot on fire with love for him and her lamp is filled with oil. The story of Daniel is also an important foreshadow of end time events. And just like Daniel had to go through the fire in the time of Babylon and Jesus was with him in the fire, so Abba Father has promised to never leave you or forsake you. He will be with you in the fire of the end times when the world is once again in the grip and control of Babylon and Egypt. Hebrews 13 verse 5 to 6 is a wonderful scripture for us to hold on to for these times where it says God himself has said, I will not in any way fail you nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not. And it really does say that three times. I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake you, nor let you down, or relax my hold on you. Assuredly not. So we can take comfort and are encouraged and confidently and boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be seized with alarm. I will not fear or dread or be terrified. What can man do to me? So please remember that in these difficult times. Abba Father has a purpose for the pressure we are going to increasingly experience, and that is to prepare you as the bride. What I'm hearing people say a lot at the moment is a lot of pressure is being put on me. The pressure is increasing. You see, we are either changed and transformed through prayer or under pressure. The bride being a witness or light, which is represented by the burning candles on the menorah, burns from olive oil. And I explained in session seven, part two, that olive oil, which represents the anointing of the Holy Spirit, 
is produced through pressing under pressure. Jesus went through an incredible amount of pressure, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, and physically in the Garden of Gethsemane, which was by no coincidence a garden of olive trees. And Gethsemane, directly translated into English, means olive press. Through the pressure of the difficult circumstances of the end times, the bride is going to be pressed. And coming from the sanctification in her that happens as a result of this pressing, the oil, which is the anointing of the Holy Spirit, is going to be released, which is the tremendous spiritual authority that she will operate in as a result. And that is the connection to the outpouring of the spirit of Elijah, where she walks in incredible spiritual power and authority in the end times with many, many supernatural miracles taking place. So now we understand the two witnesses, the two lampstands and the two olive trees prophesied about in Zechariah, Ezekiel and the book of Revelations which is the Jewish people of Israel and the Christians coming together to complete Yahweh's bride. And we have seen how the seven biblical feasts plays a key role in this process. Now scripture commands us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It wasn't a gentle request or suggestion, it was a command. In that regard, I often used to wonder why Abba Father would tell us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem when that is not what is going to happen. Scripture prophesies that there will be war in the end times and it will all be revolved around Israel and Jerusalem. There is most definitely not going to be peace in Jerusalem. So why pray for something that's not going to happen? While it is important to pray for Israel and Jerusalem, but Revelations 21 verse 2 says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I read the scripture to you to show you that the bride is the new Jerusalem. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom, which means complete fulfillment. Praying for the peace of Jerusalem means that we must pray for the fulfillment of all the things that the biblical feasts represent concerning Yeshua and his bride. Song of Solomon 7 verse 10 says, I belong to my beloved and his desire is for me. Yeshua has always desired his fruitful bride and to tabernacle with her for all eternity.
pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls. Prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brethren and companions, I will now say, Peace be within you. I would like to read a section of a book by Sarah from Bridal Harvest Ministries, which consists of a series of letters where she wrote down things that Yeshua himself said to her and showed her, which is very valuable in the context of all that I have shared in this session. What is written down in this section is what Sarah heard Yeshua say in literally an audible voice. I was sitting on my bed, busy repenting, asking Yeshua to wash me and to help me to practice and live everything that he is graciously teaching. I never only want to deliver the word of Yahweh, I want to live his word every day. This is my desire. Yahweh, help me. And that speaks for me too. As I was repenting, I suddenly heard Yeshua's voice in my left ear. He anointed my ear and I heard him speaking audibly, but in another language. It was so awesome to hear Holy Spirit's voice almost translating inside of Yeshua's voice. Holy Spirit is the spirit of understanding and therefore we are able to understand his words and Holy Spirit alone enables us to hear and understand Yahweh that is far above our own understanding. That is one of the reasons we have to be baptized with the fullness of the sevenfold Holy Spirit in Isaiah 11 verse 2. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. We can only understand the things of the Spirit if we are baptized with the spirit of understanding, if we not only have religious understanding that is conformed to the mind. I truly want to urge Yahweh's people to be very careful to reject the things that are of the Spirit because it does not fit into your framework and understanding. If it seems foreign, test it. Test everything, but do not just reject it, because if you reject a word from Yahweh, you reject him. So Yeshua started speaking with authority and urgency, and this is what he said. I am coming. Tell the people I am coming to gather my prepared bride in the rapture as recorded in my word. This is what I send you out for, to warn and prepare the people for the rapture, because it will be as I have clearly said in my word. Look, what do you see? I saw the same original book, the Bible, that I saw in the last letter. Again, he said, look, and he opened the word to me, and I saw a place where he himself speaks about the rapture, but not using the word rapture. The whole Bible was written in a language that looks the most like Hebrew, but it was Yahweh's kingdom language that is made up of words that form pictures and parables. Many of the things are literal, but many of it is prophetic pictures, 
and through Holy Spirit's understanding, he can make his mysteries known to us. The word that I saw that we know as the rapture was made up out of a picture of a trumpet, and it had different parts that explain exactly what will happen. Listen to what I say. I am the word. The written word that you know as the Bible is not in its original form as I am. It has changed through the ages, conformed to the natural mind's understanding. Repent on behalf of the people who have translated it, adding to and leaving out what I have said, because now you may think that you understand my words, but you don't. The people understand it with their minds, but it isn't rhema, which is revelation by the Holy Spirit. I want the people to understand it through my spirit kingdom language. If you do not read my word in spirit, you will be deceived. Therefore, I want you to tell the people, warn them, tell them that the word says that the rapture will be soon. I will gather my bride to meet me in the air, suddenly, in the blink of the eye, when Babylon is fast asleep. My bride watches, she waits, she listens for the sound of the trumpet. Tell the people that no one knows the day or the hour but my father. I am the only one that knows my father's heart. Let me explain to you the Trinity so that my people may understand. Remember this, in your Bibles, the word rapture and the word Trinity are not found. Does this mean that it is not the truth? Certainly not. I am Yahweh. I am Yeshua. I am Ruach HaKodesh, which means Holy Spirit in Hebrew. We are one. I am fire. Yahweh. I am is the blue flame of our fire. It is the heat of I am that consumes everything human. You cannot contain I am. Therefore, Yeshua I am is the red flame. I became the way for you not to be consumed by my holiness, like Moses at the burning bush. Yahweh sent me, and your Bible says the angel of Yahweh, because I am the messenger of Yahweh's holiness, showing you the fire of our holiness without consuming you. See, I am grace. I am love. Still, I am so intertwined with my Abba that you need Holy Spirit, the breath of my life, to breathe over you, kindling my fire in you, keeping me burning in you. Holy Spirit is the part of I am that enables us to, to communicate with you and enables you to grasp what I am. I tell you, my people, you cannot understand me. You will die. You can never, never see I am, for you will lose your life. I am that I am. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. My grace you cannot fathom. Therefore I tell you that I am the only one that knows and makes known my Father's heart. Yahweh is the intensity of I am, the beginning and the end, Elohim. Abba Yahweh knows the day of my second coming. He knows when my bride will be raptured. I am the one who will not make known to you the day or the hour. But I am the one who reveals to you the signs, the times, and the seasons. I will make known to you the season of the rapture. It will be in a short while. You are now still in a season of awakening. You are in a season where the vibrations of the trumpet will hit the atmosphere and the heavens before the sound hits you. Awake, I tell you. Keep on delivering my messages and warnings without hesitation, because the people need to awaken now. I tell you, it is a short while. Blow your trumpet warning, because you can see what is coming. 
sound it so that the people may know the sound of my trumpet when it is sounded. Then Yeshua started speaking about something that he commissioned me to do regarding Israel that I will share when he allows. Judgment will come against Israel. It will be my trumpet to awaken them so that their hearts will return to their Messiah. You will see the trees starting to blossom and the eyes of my people starting to open. I ask, but he asked in more of a commanding way, my gentle bride to pray for my beloved Israel. My gentle gentile bride is watching, waiting in anticipation for his sister Israel to awaken and rise to join her at the marriage supper. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I saw Yeshua's bride entering into the ark, and at the same time, I saw the bride being raptured to meet Messiah in the air. While she is ascending, she's being transfigured into a spirit body. Everyone then received crowns, etc., according to their works of humility and obedience in his kingdom. Everyone was clothed and prepared to rule with Yahweh in the millennium. I saw the new Jerusalem prepared as a bride for her husband. Can you 
see the time is near But no one really seems to care Don't you realize when you die to self You will gain life in the end Oh, I don't know I don't know Will we hear the trumpet sound? Will we hear you call our name? Oh, I don't know of Jerusalem Your kingdom shall come down And He will rule among us all You first came as our Savior But You will come back as our judge